Welcome back, everyone. We are live for another episode of Growing With My Fellow Growers. I apologize about the little bit of a mishap the last week or two. I uh, wasn't here on the 4th of July. I was back home in Ohio, and I, it was late and uh, phone dying for the episode last week, and thankfully the rest of the panel picked up the slack, but I'm back here we are this week. So uh, I'm going to pass it over next to Matthew Gates. Welcome, Matthew. Hey everyone, this is Matthew Gates, and I'm an integrated pest management specialist, which you can say five times fast. And you can find my content about pests and treatment, and even some observational footage that I recently posted on my channel, uh, YouTube channel Xenthanol, which I will also be commenting in uh, below. And I'm very happy to be here as always, and I'm excited to talk about whatever topics we're going to do. Good to have you back as always. And next up, Kyle Breeder. Hey everybody, my name is Kyle Breeder. I am a cannabis breeder that typically specializes in feminized seeds. If that's something you're looking for or you're into, I have a website, which is uh, the letter P followed by breeding.com. Uh, I'm on all social media platforms at Predicated Breeding and uh, in my bio on my feeds, my Instagram and Facebook feeds, you can see I did some interviews if anyone's trying to see kind of what I'm all about. And uh, thanks for hosting Jack, appreciate it. Thank you for joining us once again. And next up, Aaron the Grower. What's up, guys? Um, nice to see everyone again. I'm Aaron the Grower, ATG Acres on Instagram, YouTube, and atgacres.com. Um, yeah, can't wait to talk to you guys today. Thank you to have you back. And next up, Noah the Grower. Hey, how's it going, everybody? Uh, yeah, I'm uh, Noah the Grower with two E's on Instagram. You can find me there. If you've got any questions, you can hit me up. And uh, I'm here most weeks on this show and happy to be here. Happy to have you back. I just sort of uh, laughed to myself because I realized there's an artist, Megan The Stallion, and she has two E's as well. So uh, The instead of The. So Noah The Grower. Next up, The, the American One. Welcome. Hey, Jack. Welcome back. I'm glad you're here. Uh, it's good to see everybody on the panel and everyone in chat. Um, the American one on the YouTubes and the American one underscore with underscore E Keens on the IGs. If you want to find me or whatever. And I'm glad to be here. I'm, uh, I wish Brandon was here though, but it's all good. He might pop in. Who knows? I don't know if he uh, sent one saying that he's not going to be there. I know Dr. MJ won't be with us this week. He let, let us know in the uh, group chat, but I think a fun topic would be to maybe talk a little bit about how to go about setting up a grow space, how much space each person uh, uses roughly, and how you came to use that much space. Uh, but one thing I wanted to say is that thank you to the American one, allegedly for uh, hypothetically sending a sample of that Velvet Punch F2. Came through, it was really uh, delicious. I've broken through about half the sample so far and it's definitely got some uh, nice fruity and uh, earthy, gassy characteristics to it. Um, you said that you had a watermelon phenol. I definitely think that I got more watermelon like sweetness out of it than grapey, which is uh, cool to see. So uh, definitely thankful that that made it through and uh, the little birdie got it there and uh, really awesome stuff. I wish it was a little bit larger, but yeah, it's, that, that was really good flavorful, st flavorful stuff, no doubt. You got to give uh, Johnny Canacy some tips on how to get those uh, packages sent with uh, out a scent. So uh, that's the last I'll say about that. But I wanted to get into a little bit about um, a lot of new growers do listen to the show and how to sort of plan for if you don't have a grow space, where do you start? Like uh, how much space will you need and how do you go about figuring out how much cannabis you're trying to grow and like maybe work backwards doc would have been a great person to have on this week because i know he's got the grow light calculator which even has like an estimate for how many grams or ounces you can harvest off a specific grow light but i guess uh for me first personally a uh, easy way to do it is try and figure out how much you use per week or per month and try and uh, basically calculate that out for the entire year and see if you have the ability with your space. Like for me personally, I'm limited by space, so I won't be able to grow enough for myself and my wife. I grow enough for like just me and uh, we share it. So we go through it and still get stuff from outside. But if I was tr trying to set up a space to be completely independent, um, I would try and I would need more space. So I'm just curious, I'll uh, pass it over to the American one. Cause I know you've got kind of a, uh, mishmash of uh, spaces going. I don't know if you know your exact square footage, but I'm curious how you came to it and uh, if you have any thoughts or ideas for a new grower trying to set up. Yeah, I would definitely, um, I definitely have a lot of different areas. And if I was going to give advice to someone, I would, I would ask them what their goals are. If they just want to, you know, make enough for themselves or their family and friends, or if they wanted to do something more. But I would definitely say start out relatively small 
And then you could always add, like, I would tell them to get a four, four by four tent probably because then you don't have to have any extra building costs. You just put up the tent and, uh, and then get an appropriate light for that space. And then, but, but the other part is like the veg area and stuff. So it would be, you know, uh, different for every person, but that's where I would start. If I was going to, uh, try and talk someone into starting, or if they asked me for advice, I would say, get a four by four, maybe, a um, you know, a, uh, uh, fluorescent or fluorescent with LED bulbs in it for a little veg area, and I would start there. The f- fluorescent with LED is nice because you don't even need like a tent or crazy setup. You could just have like a little right. side area, workbench. In your house yeah. by a wall, workbench, whatever. Um, yeah. One thing that I thought about when you were talking was some people actually, if they don't have a significant other who uses cannabis, they might be able to get away with in a single four by four or even a two by four. Uh, someone I know is starting to grow. They did the math for their year. I think they use like an ounce per month or maybe two ounces per month. And we figured out how much uh, they can get in a two by four, just doing like three crops per year. And they can actually do a little bit more than three crops per year, but that's more than they would personally need. So right. and they could the veg, thing. they could veg in that one four by four too, if they really wanted to. Yeah. And you know what else I just realized? Some people have access to buying clones, so they might not even need, you know, um, a veg area or or even you know a cloning area so that's a good point the person that i'm working with um like myself i think just having them get up and started by popping a bunch of seeds growing a few things out uh narrowing it down to the few best ones keeping the strongest ones and then flowering those out and um i think that with the few crops per year that they'll be able to get having a few different varieties will be nice uh, different ph- phenotypes and seeing how they grow and things like that it's a cool process it, i hand right now i'm monocropping i just uh decided that i'm either gonna put a plant out in nature the donny burger is either gonna go gorilla grow somewhere uh in san diego allegedly hypothetically or it's gonna be gifted to my barber <laughs> because uh the american ones um amy aces has won out i just am so impressed with how that plant has grown from the vigor when it popped from seed to uh all the way over to now it's in late veg about to flip uh, both those plants have been amazing, and I'm excited to see what comes from that. But Kyle, I'm curious. I know you've got a bunch of different tents and things like that as well. Uh, what would your advice be to a new grower, or uh, how would you go about setting up a new space if you had to start all over again? Well, uh, that's a good one, man, because obviously, I mean, I have like a whole different objective. But um, yeah, I guess I think, you know, when Noah said uh, it's really what they're trying to achieve, you know, if, uh, if they're just looking for mass weight or if they're just trying to uh you know fulfill their own uh their own consumption and stuff like that um but i think he, like he said maybe a four by four i mean i love a four by eight four by eight man you have so much room to play with with, with clones and uh little seedlings and uh, i mean you have tons of room to branch stuff out because uh, i know when i got i think i started off with a four by four and i immediately ended up jumping to four by eight because i was just like packing things in there because things were getting big or i had things at different stages and I just didn't have enough room. So I, I, I would probably suggest the four bait. And then you have room. It's always better to have more room than to not have room. Then you're just squishing plants in there and they're all like, you know, uh, just intertwined with each other. And then you have humidity issues and they're all just, uh, or other pro- IPM type problems when they're that. Does the four by eight have there. a center wall? Like, can you separate it into like a veg on one side and the flower on the other side, or is it all completely open? It's completely open, but you could get, they have uh, tents that do that where they have like a, a Velcro in that middle where you could separate the two. Um, and it does a really good job too at keeping the light out. Um, so I would suggest that personally, I think it's a really good idea to kind of roll with. I've even seen tents that have like a three chamber. It's like your flower space is the main box. Let's say it's like a two by three. And then there's like a one by three that has a metal, like a shelf. So you've got your clones up top and then your veg plants down low. So it's trying to be like an all in one tent type setup. But, um, I personally think a little bit more space would be helpful. Uh, I know Aaron, the grower, is a outdoor and greenhouse guy, but I'm curious, um, Aaron, before we go over to Noah, um, what would you be your approach of if you had to start all over again? Um, how would you go about figuring out how much space you need and, and setting up that space? I think the first question is budget. So if you, I just sent my buddy home with a clone and a, and a $20 LED from Home Depot. This, you know, he's going to put that in his closet. So if we're talking cheap, 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 just clear out some clothes out of a closet, throw them on the ground, throw them on the floor. Who cares? You're going to have a crop. So grow in the corner of your closet, hang a little light that you can get from Home Depot. That's like, they call it a plant light. This is like a $20 LED. Like if I had $0 in my pocket or $20 in my pocket, this is, this is what I would do. And, you know, start small, like, like Tao said, and just 
move up and, you know, start looking at the larger LEDs and maybe the smaller HPSs. Um, but yeah. I really like that suggestion um, because, you know, one plant, let's say it yields you one ounce. I don't know where most people or what people are paying, but let's say it's like 100 to 200, maybe 250 an ounce, depending on where people are at. That's $100 or $200 that they don't have to uh, use to go buy cannabis because they've got, they've grown their own and they can reinvest that into getting themselves maybe like a reflective wall. I know that those, um, they make these emergency blankets that are used for like, if somebody goes into shock, you wrap it around them, but it's a mylar, basically a mylar sheet. And they're really cheap. You can get them at like the 99 cents or maybe like a few of them in a pack. So you could, if you're doing what Aaron was talking about with just like a $20 Home Depot LED, throw up a few of these Mylar things and you've got yourself basically a homemade tent. You could either staple or uh, tape or whatever you have to do to put it up. And um, tent, I think, is the next step up from that because it is not a huge investment. I think most of them are between like 80 and 200 bucks, depending on the size. And um, they have poles that you can hang your lights from and uh, mount your equipment in. But there's also the building out your setup option, which uh, Noah the Grower has elected to do that. I'm curious, Noah, if you had to do it all again, uh, how would you go about starting? Well, I've told this story before, but uh, I started uh, in my closet. And I just had a good buddy of mine come over, buy like a, we bought a big uh, sheet of particle board and some hinges and a handle. He cut out a door for me. And then I took like, uh, we took some, uh, some pipe. I got like a 600 watt. Uh, it was just a little, a little teeny like hood, but then we got a 600 watt ballast. I couldn't afford the thousand watt. The ballast was like 140 bucks. The hood was like maybe 80. I got like a reducer and reduced it up to a four inch exhaust. I think the whole setup was like maybe, God, it's been so long, but almost 11, I think it was like 450. It was basically under 500 bucks. And it, you know, I'd had my, my buddy give me like eight clones and I just vegged them, you know, straight in that. And then, you know, after they got about, you know, I don't even know, two and a half feet tall, I flipped them to flower and I had one 600 watt light. And I swear I got, and they were all in twos. That's all my buddy had. He gave me the pots that and I went and bought a couple of bags of dirt and I got like 20 something ounces off of those eight plants. And at the time, you know, weed was worth quite a bit of money. And so, but I mean, I was saved so much money that got me, you know, that, that was enough weed for me for four or five months. And you know, at the time we was like 250, 280 an ounce. I think it was at the time for really good stuff. And I mean, it, it that's how I got started. And then, I, you know, eventually I just branched out. I had my same buddy come over, built me a little five by 10 thing. I had two hoods in there an exhaust fan. And of course, then that's the main thing. I'll, you, when you start talking about any type of a decent light and a setup like that four by eight, you're going to have to figure out how to move that air. You're going to have to figure out how to keep it cool. You know, in the wintertime, if that room's not, you know, doesn't have heat, you're going to have to worry about it keep it warm. So there's a lot of stuff that goes into it. But uh, I, I would definitely just say start in a closet or, or a tent, four by four. You know what I mean? You're going to, if you get the right LED light, you're not going to have to worry about too much, you know, you know, heating and cooling. You're obviously going to have to worry about heating I mean, cooling. But uh, yeah, that's how I would start off probably. And that's how I did start off. It sounds like a good way. And it's definitely gotten you to a place where I'd say you're very successful with your setup. And uh, I think a lot of people would be surprised about the return on investment if they haven't started growing yet. Some people, believe it or not, who listen to these shows are not growers yet. They're just cannabis fans or part of the cannabis community and they haven't began growing. And um, I think a lot of people are shocked just at the return on investment. Like I think Noah said, you got about 20 ounces on your first crop. My first crop was 12 and it was just in the closet. And I spent less than a grand to get set up and uh, it was a little less expensive for me at the time, but Bud was going for about 220 an ounce if I was to go buy it either on the street or from a friend, wherever. So uh, for me to get 12 ounces, that's $2,640 that I saved, which is literally more than double my initial investment on the first crop. And then every single crop after that, it's just like here's the amount of money saved is absolutely crazy um, compared to going and buying it on the street or at a dispensary or wherever most people are getting it from. And granted, prices are coming down probably closer to like the 100 to 150 an ounce, maybe even less depending on where you live or maybe even more. But it definitely uh, saves you a bunch of money to grow your own. That's why the show is called The Cheap Home Grow. Uh, helps everybody save their own money growing inside. And uh, one of our experts that we have here with us today is Matthew Gates, uh, a staff writer at Skunk Magazine. I'm going to pass it over to you next and ask him if he has any thoughts or considerations uh, from an IPM perspective on uh, when you go to set up your grow space, uh, most people being on the indoor grow setting. So, 
you know, I don't want to, um, I, I don't want to like repeat the same things that I often do say. So I'll, I'll say those things really quickly first. And if people have questions, they can put them in the chat. But basically, uh, you know, I love to say that people underestimate things like physical barriers. So um, the traditional kind of IPM techniques, what, some of them are like biological, chemical, cultural, physical, things like this. So these are descriptions that people use to kind of orient them. And uh, I think physical barriers in particular, um, not necessarily of like things like pathogens and spores that can like float on the air, um, but like of like insects, small insects, thrift screen in particular, um, can, can keep moths out. Um, I get tons of messages from people and uh, people are dealing with moths coming out, um, mostly in the springtime. Um, and they lay their eggs and uh, some of those caterpillars born to the buds and you get budworms. And those are a huge problem. And uh, somebody in the chat even was asking what you can do about boring worms. Now, there are beetles and moths um, and even some flies and wasps that can bore into like plant stems and, and do damage. And we just don't know. Actually, Aaron uh, sent me a, a picture or media a while ago of um, something called a square head wasp that uh, was doing that. Uh, and I think that was in already dead uh, yeah. plant material, right? Yeah, it was just recently harvested. <clears throat> At least that's when I discovered it. And it looked like it had happened after I had harvested it. Um, so it was a stalk sticking out of the ground. Yeah, that was like, that must've been like five years ago or something now. It's, it's it really been memory. so long? Yeah, yeah I wow. think so, yeah. Um, Make you feel old? Yeah. Experience uh, I wise. I was just, <laughs> I was yeah, just weather. watching. I was just yesterday, yesterday night. Um, I, uh, I saw the scene in uh, Brave Little Toaster that, uh, that song about worthless cars as they're like going to the fucking, <laughs> the, uh, the, uh, the crusher. And that thing is, I don't know. I think, uh, <laughs> that, that'll mess you up. <laughs> uh, don't watch that don't watch that scene so but back on the topic i bring this up because there are a lot of things out there that people don't know about and um especially with cannabis pests coming out uh flea beetles are another thing i've been seeing recently and one way you can get rid of this problem entirely is by ha is by setting up these barriers and i know a lot of people are growing in their own their own house their own room or whatever um but having those like extra layers of like just physical defense are helpful caulking places um you know making it so that your the interior of your house is already kind of pest proof it does two nice things for you one it keeps the plant pests out two it might also help keep the residential pests out as well and um you know both of those things are kind of nice and, and good for your health and that kind of a thing um, i um yeah i think you'd be happy with my um physical barrier ipm i have two layers of uh insect screen behind my actual screen because there was a small crack and it actually acts as like a shade cloth keeping the house a little bit cooler and keeping not only bugs but like dust and other things from being drawn in through the uh, window fan so definitely something that's easy to implement uh, a lot of people i think maybe overestimate how difficult it is to basically use these sort of ipm, IPM tactics a physical barrier being one that you buy one time set up on a few different areas of your house where you have potential intake uh, outside and you can protect yourself for years and uh, only have to replace it every so often. So it's definitely a suggestion that I've uh, taken and put into my personal use in my home garden. I just realized that I did the thing I didn't want to do. So I'll, I just want to add another thing, which is just uh, uh, really pay attention to the plants growing in your, in your area. I talked about that a lot too, but I suppose it, it bears repeating, especially now as the seasons change and um, a lot of insects, at least in the West coast, at least in the, the upper uh, hemisphere in North America and in places like this. Um, a lot of the weedy plants are, are dying. Um, they're, they're drying out and all these um, thrips and other small insects that maybe are usually an innocuous pest or no pest at all. Um, they are moving out of those locations and they're going to swarm where they can find juicy plant material. Um, and that's usually cultivation areas, places of agriculture, and they can also be residents. So be careful. Uh, check the plants around your area and your property um, and, and maybe even proactively destroy ones that aren't um, serving a, a particular purpose for you in the cultivation sphere or generally supporting the uh, local 
um, ecosystem. Cut out those unuseful plants. And I want to say it's 420 here. And somebody who enjoys the 420 spirit is my man, Spartan Grown, who's not with us this week because it's his birthday. I want to say happy birthday, Spartan Grown. Cheers to him. Everybody make sure you give uh, lots of love to Spartan Grown this weekend. It was his birthday. That's why he's not joining us on the panel. And uh, I was going to hit this vape pen, but then I remembered he said that he fucking hate, hates vape pens. So uh, everybody else put some smoke up in the air and uh, say cheers to Spartan Grown. And uh, if you remember to maybe send a comment or DM or something his way. Uh, let him know that he's loved and missed this week and that the cheap home grow is uh, always happy to have him. And uh, yeah, make sure you give Spartan lots of love because I'm always a big fan of him being on the show. I'll smoke to that. Happy birthday, Spartan. Cheers, boys. I don't know how old he is, but he's definitely aging well. And I think uh, I'm an advocate for people doing like he did, uh, changing fields and going into something that you love, even if uh, in his case, which he's openly talked about many times, he took a pay cut, switched fields, got into something that he is more passionate about. And I think he's just a happier person. So uh, I'm proud of him and uh, what he's doing. I'm really happy uh, listening back to last week's episode, hearing that he's going to be featured on the can of cribs or the deeply deep roots, I think is what they call the basically smaller version of it. But uh, really cool. I've, I've watched can of cribs for a while. It's um, they tour some of the larger, facilities all around the u.s and it's cool to see the legal markets and they're getting highlighted and i think rightfully so because they're doing a damn good job and they have a really killer facility so uh, shout out to michigan matt and the team over at mitten canico because they're all doing really great work and uh, can't give enough love to the people over in michigan not just spartan but the uh, whole crew michigan bros grow show uh fucking talking shit with eagle fam uh all the good people over there so cheers to michigan and uh, i guess getting back to the uh, growth topic I'm looking through the chat and not seeing any IPM questions. And unless Matthew, maybe you saw one you'd like to get to. Um, I think we've definitely. Uh, covered... I'm just, I'll, I'll echo what Smog Poker said that uh, hornworms are really a big pain, really, very difficult. And uh, I'm surprised that some, assuming that uh, you've been growing them for longer than one season, I'm surprised that this is your first time dealing with them. Um, but uh, that, that just speaks to the fact that uh, populations shift and change rapidly and constantly. So, you know, what happens one year is not guaranteed the next year. And uh, that's a that's a story of agriculture as long as time. And if uh, MJ Coco was here, I think he'd agree with that pretty vehemently. That's a good point. I wanted to get back to something we talked about a little bit before the show. Uh, the American one kind of alluded to um, maybe the government listening in on text messages and, and creeping on that kind of thing. And I think it's just a good reminder to have good um, if you're especially in a red state and you're trying to grow your own, listening to these types of shows, ba making sure that you have good security and uh, basically not telling people that don't need to be involved with your operations and uh, making basically like an anonymous account. If you have an Instagram or social media that's not attached to your real name or uh, addresses like that, I think can be a good practice for a lot of people in the cannabis community um, and just general ways to look after ourselves. And uh, the conversation was, <laughs> we joked, that people often DM myself and many others on this panel and ask like, Hey, do you ship? Like meaning, Hey, will you ship me bud? Or um, like what's for sale? Like, and things like that. Even if we write like nothing for sale on every single post and in, in our uh, Instagram profile. So uh, Matthew joked, it's like, Hey, I swear I'm not in the DEA, but will you incriminate yourself? And basically like say to a complete stranger that, Hey, I'll illegally do some transaction with you. So just a friendly reminder to anybody who's listening to the show who may have a cannabis page out there to look out for those uh, sometimes shady messages. It might seem like a quick way to make some money, but uh, I suggest that you do not respond or if you do just have fun with them. Don't actually uh, say anything that could get yourself in trouble. Yeah. Practice good cybersecurity. You know what? You reminded me of something, Jack, and I'm going to, I'm going to steal a couple more minutes and say that, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm curious, Jack, did you have a power fluctuation in your area recently? May have, but I was out of town for about 12 days. That's true. Dang, I forgot. <laughs> but uh, anyways, uh, where I'm located, there was a, um, a, a bit of a power fluctuation, not a power surge, but a kind of almost a very small dip in like voltage or something. And a lot of uh, appliances and things all, like still stayed on and everything but like I, I know for at least for one person their uh, uh their monitor kind of shifted a little bit but everything was fine the computer didn't get told or anything like that um i just want to remind everyone of my amazing purchase i got a you uh, uh uninterrupted power source for my computer for exactly this reason because it's getting hot the infrastructure is failing in a lot of places and 
you know, speaking of setups, you better make sure that you have a power contingency. I think Dude, if you're going to spend all this money. That's, that's like a, that, that those things are the most badass little like non-generator backup generators. It's basically they're for your, uh, you know, electronic equipment. And we have one here for, for the more sensitive computer equipment on the property. And it's, uh, it's been a lifesaver at least uh, two times. There you go. Imagine like each of those times you had to like start from nothing. I just went through data recovery and I spent many hundreds of dollars. Let's put it that way on getting very important data, both personal and professional. So which is worth it in the, in the long run. Dollar for dollar for the UPC. Exactly. No, I just wanted to say on the subject that uh, Jack was talking about there, man, that's the one thing that I wish I could go back in time. And, uh, you know, obviously cyber and all that, but, you know, I'm kind of old school and, uh, man, I would just recommend that most people just don't tell anyone anything about your grow. Like, I mean, obviously maybe you should talk to like a really, really good friend or, you know, something like that, but you don't want everyone to know because they say for every single person that you tell that person tells five people. And I mean, (laughs) then people just kind of like, I don't know it. I would just recommend being more anonymous, you know, and and this society that we're living in, like everybody wants to put stuff online and I'm, Hey, I'm I'm as guilty of that as anyone. I love posting. I love posting. But as you guys know, I post certain things in our, in our group chat that I would never post. You know what I mean? Like, so it's, Hey, you know, you, you want to do what you want to do, but just, just be careful. That's all I'm going to say. Remember that you're never talking to a person themselves on these systems. You're talking through an avatar. Right. And so for me, it helps because I like to think of myself generally, and I think it's true that I'm a pretty uh, accommodating person. And even to the chagrin of some people that I know in real life, in person, sometimes if it's a stranger on the street or if somebody is having some issues or something, I might check in with that person, even if they're a complete stranger. In some places in the world, this is a bad idea and you really shouldn't do it. Um, and other places I've been told, wow, you're so American for doing that, having foreign friends um, who've, who've let me know that at least for them and their experience, this is a very surprising behavior. Um, that being said, living in the world has required of me. And I think what you're trying to get at is very true. Uh, it's the same thing. We have to, you have to like, just, you have to kind of steal yourself. And um, what helps for me is to kind of remember that I'm not talking to somebody in person. There's a medium between us. And so maybe don't feel so harsh on yourself or feel bad about being a little bit more um, protective. You know, don't believe everything you see. You don't really know. You can't really confirm who you're talking to. Um, We're not just uh, paranoid stoners. Not to sound conspiratorial. (laughs) No, I don't. And I think that people who know whose accounts are whose, I mean, I think that that's fine. I don't think people are stealing people's accounts and DDoSing others and, or, or doing anything like that. I'm just saying that, um, you know, especially in group chats, not so much like, you know, person to person, but like in group chats, you know, you just never know something can happen. I hate to say it, but most oftentimes it's people that people know. It's people's friends and their family. It's somebody that they told or somebody they told, told. I think Noah said you told one person, they tell five. I've heard you tell one person, they tell 10. As if it's about cannabis, probably because it's such a fucking interesting thing uh, in most areas of the country. And for a long time, it was so highly illegal that that's like a really big deal. Uh, sometimes if you had a good friend, that hopefully they wouldn't tell anybody. But a lot of people just uh, have issues keeping their mouth shut. <laughs> and so it's definitely... Uh, I like the European guys way of looking at it. A lot of them are still in highly, highly illegal situations. So they go no smell, no tell, no sell, which I think is a good philosophy. Unless you absolutely, you know, I get it. Some people out there have to make money on this and uh, I respect that as well. There's a hustle to it. But um, for the people that are just doing it for their personal need, uh, that that will keep you out of a lot of trouble for sure. Those three rules. And you could just, for years, I just said I had a really good friend who did it. You know, and I'm really good friends with myself, so I wasn't lying. <laughs> I yeah, say I like that, that right now. All right, even today, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I got to be honest. Like, I remember, and you no, know, when you initially said this, it, all I did was bring like like extreme memories. So I had like a close friend who I thought was a close friend back when I was living in Florida, and I had like a secret spot in the woods, and I was like growing. I was like 18 years old, you know. I was like growing these plants, and they were like just about to start flowering. And when I I told this one kid thing, and he wouldn't tell anybody because he was like a close friend, and I came back. Like 
they waited a little bit so I didn't see mommy's but well, like, within a week I went back and the shit was gone he was like the only one that could ever find out who that was and so it's like it, like you said I mean whether it's greed or just people blabbing their mouth you just got to be careful on who you tell Dude, uh, where were you at growing in because we grew up about the same time where were you in Florida uh Jacksonville the Arlington area okay because I have a very similar story from uh uh, in the West Palm area, I was growing in the woods with my buddy. He didn't jack me or anything, but we killed the plant because we're idiots. But uh, yeah, very, very similar <laughs> fucking Florida woods growing story. Dude, they got some crazy ass shit in those woods, man. Like the banana spiders and all that shit. Holy fuck. Yep. Hell no. <laughs> and it hurts 10 times worse when it's somebody you think is a friend and it can ruin or change your friendship, you know? I also yeah. want to put in the point of uh, just possible deniability too. Sometimes it's totally unintentional, you know, um, like just, just add a, a, at least a note of like uh, complexity there. Right. Like sometimes what happens is that information is gathered about somebody else uh, or noticed, you know, I don't want to sound like it's all like, you know, like there's somebody out there trying to like attack you or something. For some people, this is actually true. Um, especially people who are, who have some level of notoriety or if they are um, maybe very rich or they own a big company or something like that. Um, like phishing scams are called whaling, I think for that reason, that sort of stuff. Uh, so, so, you know, this information um, over time, it builds up and people notice patterns and some people decide to exploit those people because they're desperate or whatever. And um, I take physical and cybersecurity mostly uh, mostly seriously, except I have an internet personality or <laughs> I'm out here talking to people and stuff. So, um, uh, I, I guess I'm not doing that totally. So maybe don't follow my advice completely. I think I know, honestly, I know one thing, I know one thing that everybody can agree on. People will do almost anything if they're broke. So be careful, uh, be careful of that. <laughs> well, and I almost think that some people are safer to communicate with people online than people that they know in person. Like somebody could show their pictures of their grow to like someone like me who's in California. I don't give a shit if you're in South Korea or in Florida or wherever you're at doing your thing. I'm actually going to help you out because I just I want to help everyone grow. Um, but if you show it to somebody who's local to you, who has access, like I was talking about earlier, like even a small closet harvest, uh, 12 ounces, that could be a few grand and a few thousand dollars is enough temptation for a lot of people to make um, maybe unwise decisions. So it's something that I think people like to it's it's so exciting to talk about so i think that's beautiful that we have an online canvas space where you can be anonymous you can come on and be called smart poker and i have no idea where the fuck you live you know and smart poker's been dropping some amazing comments all night in the chat so i just called them out because uh i always think that's a fun name but also it's like does anybody know who smart poker is Do you know where smart poker is it's like he can come on and, and share and, and ask questions and engage fairly safely without feeling like Oh, somebody's going to track this back to me, um, which is, I think, the beauty of the online cannabis space and uh, what so many of us uh, benefit from. That's exactly why I started my page. That's exactly how I came to this show. I was in the Discord room, totally anonymous, and Shane seen some, some of my pictures I was posting and was like, hey, what's up? I'm doing this uh, cheap home grow show. I was wondering if you wanted to maybe like get interviewed. And like that's how this all started. So I totally agree with that. How do you guys feel about giving advice to people that live in states that are completely uh, anti, but still want to be like a part of the community? I so I think that if they're adults, they should accept the responsibility upon themselves. They know the law within their state. They know that it's illegal. I do feel like a little bit morally um, unlike the fence about, I, I helped somebody who is in, I think, North Korea. And in North Korea, I believe it's a death sentence. And I believe the same with like China. Yeah, definitely. Countries. I'm positive oh, wow. that you're right. At least for North Korea. And so in certain circumstances, it's like if I'm giving this person advice and then they get caught, it could cost them their life. And if maybe I just discouraged it, maybe they wouldn't even get into the growing. So there is that moral quandary yeah, at least there. they had good weed on the way out, bro. You did a good thing. They're going <laughs> to grow it anyway. You're just making them grow fire. Oh. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm totally down to give anybody who's an adult advice on growing freaking anything. But that North Korea thing, that's, uh, hmm, I, I, I don't know about that. One. But as far as the United States or like Canada or you know anything like that, Germany, Europe, bring it on. Yeah, if anybody wants advice from me, man, I'll, I'll give them as much advice. I'll take advice. So yeah, that's part of the community. And someone wants to be a part of the community, I'm all for it. 
with yeah, few to, exceptions, to someone... I believe that people should like, you know, if, if they're seeking information and especially if I think that information is not very well protected, it's not secret or anything proprietary, you know, they're going to find it regardless. So, I mean, it's kind of, I always feel like that excuse or that like thing to be harsh because I've felt that before. Uh, that sort of feeling that I could have like av- averted a catastrophe or something because I, but because I like enabled it. Right. But like, eh, you know, has, somebody wants to do something, they're going to do it. Unfortunately. Yeah. Like, yeah. That's the thing. So I, anyone... I feel like you're better giving them advice. And, and the first piece of advice is being extra stealthy, giving the advice I gave earlier, no smell, no sell, no tell. So if you teach them to not basically put themselves out there where if they just started growing on their own without your advice, maybe it's going to stink up and then their neighbor is going to smell it and they go to jail or get killed or whatever it is. So maybe you can actually prevent a catastrophe from happening. That's a, that's a good point. Get that carbon filter. Has anyone ever gotten charged or arrested for like a conspiracy charge for uh, helping someone cultivate cannabis? Like, cause I would think giving advice is not illegal. It's not because you're not physically partaking in the process. It'd be very, very difficult for them to charge you. I mean, like if you were physically in the state and you they had videos of you walking in and out of the building and you had like notes, right. you said, like masterminding charges. So if you got caught with notes on a grow facility, that was considered masterminding and you can get a higher charge for that. Wow. Okay, um, right. right now, one, one piece of advice I would give that I just thought of a little earlier that I partake in is there's an app called wicker which deletes your messages after like six days and it's encrypted both ways Uh, there's another one called signal which is a messaging app that works through like your text messages that is end-to-end encryption as well and there's a few other apps out there whatsapp was supposed to be but then there was an encryption issue i don't know if there's still issues with that but um people like other things like even like proton mail i think is the more secure thing than like a gmail i was wondering why everybody wants to talk on whatsapp get a vpn too if you really (laughs) I agree, but even a VPN, um, okay, I don't think it's uh, as foolproof as a lot of people imagine, but I don't have all the cybersecurity know how to really explain how that works. Um, yeah, I'm sure especially, NSA, yeah. One of, the, one of the big ones actually is if it's kind of like, a, this is metaphorical, but it's kind of like sonar or radar. It's like if it, the absence of something being there can be m- almost much more alarming, right? So like if... Um, you know, if, if you normally have a connection that's visible or whatever to some sort of surveilling, you know, entity, and then like, but you're, but like when they go to check it out, it's like totally gone or like whatever it is, doesn't exist where when something that, it, that should be there is not there, then they're going to pry harder rather than if you dip between, if you like have a, you have like a, a, a public facing activity that's, I guess, visible in one way or another. And then, uh, you know, kind of moving away from that, that's a better camouflage visually too. This is true for a lot of other things, but uh, in the case of cybersecurity, that's true too. For those who care. Um, I also have a pineapple seven right now. Um, and uh, that's very helpful for uh, certain applications. Look it up. Genetic memory I'm farm said, and I think that I've heard this as well, but I haven't looked into the validity of it that cannabis is legal in certain parts of north korea and even accepted um i don't know the honestly there's so much disinformation and and the news that comes out of north korea is so difficult to believe that um it's definitely hard to know what what is actually going on in north korea because they control the state of all the media Uh, while others argue that this is a misapprehension and that it is a drug and it's illegal okay so genetic memory farms dropping a little bit of knowledge there on the north korea topic from earlier said some of ver- observers say that cannabis is effectively legal or at least tolerated uh, so that's interesting i'm surprised to hear that it's not the way in china i'll just say that that's why i won't be going to china anytime soon the american one um did you just have your hand up oh no i was just hovering over you it said <laughs> no but um, yeah, I'm, I, after watching Locked Up Abroad a few times back in the day, I'm not planning on leaving America, I don't think. Maybe Jamaica once, you know, maybe Hawaii. Well, Hawaii is America. Uh, but yeah, I don't trust other countries. You definitely yeah, don't Hawaii. Hawaii. getting captured, man. I bought some weed in the Bahamas once. Um, got off the boat. Guy's like, guy runs up to me, puts a bracelet on my wrist. And he's like, oh, yeah, cool bracelet, right? And I said, oh, yeah, cool. He's like, you need weed? I said, yes. <laughs> he said, come with me. So he takes me to this little shop. We go to the back, like the manager's office. 
And I lay down a $20 American bill and he hands me a little ball of aluminum foil and he's like, go, go, go. So I go and I open it up outside and I'm like, I just got ripped off. I had like 1.4 nug in my hand. That was brick. But yeah, so don't buy weed in other countries. I agree. There's this, there's this like prevalent perspective that I think is partially true that like on, on the one hand, like uh, uh, sort of cannabis from like the gray market is going to have, is, is going to be like better because it won't have exposure to certain chemistries or other sorts of things that corporate groups are, are, are doing in some cases and getting burned for. But like, it's true in both cases, whether it's, you know, white, gray, black, whatever the market, like people can, first of all, make mistakes, but second of all, be greedy or or just not know um so like i just feel like yeah just be careful always know your source no matter what that source might be or um you know how legitimate it's considered to be by uh, others i was gonna say because i've also heard the story of people going to jamaica and throwing 20 dollars and getting like a garbage bag full it had like sticks and stems and branches and shit in it but <laughs> it was a whole bunch and uh it's just interesting what you know everywhere has different prices and uh, quality. costa rica you can do that. Hundred dollars for a garbage bag of weed from most farmers. Hundred dollars, American dollars, you get a garbage bag of fifty gallon garbage bag of weed. It just shows you the uh, when you grow it under the sun, the cost of production can go down to such a point where it's possible to do that. And I think that we're going to see more and more of that. Um, definitely seeing some of it in California, sun grown and even greenhouse. Uh, the scale that they have has been able to drive price down pretty low even after tons and tons of taxes and regulation and testing and all that. Um, I don't want to like, I don't want to like, you know, take over the conversation or anything, but I do remember that one of our, one of our viewers, RP, uh, um, last week I'd asked about uh, Regalia Grandiva and Venerate, the Barone Bio CG line. Um, and they wanted me to expound a bit about my opinions about it. So I could take some time to do that. Yeah, no, that'd be great. I definitely um, have seen it used. I haven't personally used it in the past. So I'd love to hear more of your perspective on it. I'd be curious to get other people's uh, opinions about it too, as well, actually. So if anyone has used uh, Grandivo Venerator Regalia, um, you know, please put your, your comments in the questions. Uh, <laughs> comments in the questions. Uh, your your uh, points in the chat. So um, I just want to go over really quickly, because even for myself, I don't always remember the active ingredients and everything. Um, there are so many things to keep track of. But uh, Grandivo's active ingredient is a uh, chromobacterium subsugi. Uh, and that's sort of a general, that has a sort of a general pesticidal effect, uh, as I understand it to be the case. Uh, Venerate is dead Burkholderia, um, specifically the strain A396. So it's actually not alive inside. It's actually the dead bacteria, but they produce um, compounds that are toxic to insects and mites. And they also disrupt the molting um, process, uh, which is really useful, the e ecdesis. And then regalia is giant knotweed et extract. And that's supposed to be, I think, for immune system priming. At least that's what I've written here. Uh, you can check out what I've said on the previous video's comment when RP asked about it. Um, but I, I wanted to say that I don't actually have a lot of experience using uh, the Maroon line or these, these particular uh, groups. I have many people that I've worked with who do use it and were already using it um, before I was working with them. And it seems to work really well. Um, but I'll, I'll kind of echo the same thing that I said here, which is that like these sort of bio-rational pesticides, um, they're kind of, uh, they're sort of a, I, I would not rely on them by themselves generally. I think other, um, you know, less harsh pesticidal agents like um, botanical insecticides and things like this are really great to use in tandem. And I think these are these are like, a, you know, to sort of show my interest in age. Uh, if you play, if you like role playing games, and video games, and things like that, it's kind of like a small mild buff, you know. And it works really well if you like. <laughs> if you use a, a greater or more powerful like bolstering agent or something like that, if you're like, you know, uh, casting a spell that gives you like barrier or like some sort of like defense, I'm, I'm probably using a bad analogy, but for my video game friends, you understand what I'm saying, I think. So it's one of those things where um, truly you want like an integrated pest management approach and, and you want to be applying these things probably um, before there's a problem, 
usually. You don't want to wait and order these sort of products and have them planned in your rotation way before you have any issues. Uh, this is true for pesticides in general, but it's very crucially true for this. Um, in some cases, you could, you could either do one of two things. You can apply it immediately when you see a problem, like a, like a new pest or something like that come out. That's appropriate for the substance and read the labels to be sure what that is. Um, or like in the case of the like immune system priming, the regalia, um, use it constantly or use it very often, spray it so that when an incidental population gets to your plants, uh, they're already um, affect, get, starting to get affected. And I want to say one more thing. Immune system priming takes away from the growth of the plant. Uh, I'm not saying that your plant can't grow really well. And I'm not saying that it's bad to do this. I'm just saying that immune system priming takes resources from the plant that would otherwise go to other processes. It says it's, there's no free lunch um, in sort of immune response, if that makes sense. Well, so totally what you're doing. in general for energy, right? Like physics will right. tell you like it can't be created or, or destroyed. So there's only a certain amount of energy that's present. And if some of it's being used for the um, immune system defense, then that's not being used for growth at the same time. Um, well, at least and not and, as much the, as it could and be. The, the mechanistic, like, I don't want to like make everything into a mechanistic argument. But like those mechanistic effects like necessarily have the effects that they do that cause differences in growth. Like they might make the plant cell wall more rigid and turgid, you know, turn up, you know, more lignin synthesis. You know, you might, you, you have all these things that will literally physically change the way that the plant's physiology works. And uh, in addition to what you're saying, that like energy is being used for this process and not this, right? So like you have both of those things going on. You have actual real, because if you didn't have real life structural or like chemical or physiological changes, then what are you even doing, right? So. I agree. And it kind of reminds me of um, a lot of people back with like the bricks conversation would think that once they had certain bricks, their thing would be like immune. And I think regalia, not that it makes it immune, it makes it more robust and more healthy and, and less likely to get attacked by pests, but it doesn't mean that it's necessarily immune. Um, it's just a part of a integrated pest management system. It's giving you basically uh, a better baseline. I was going to type something in and I totally forgot what I was going to say. Has anyone else used these products? I'm curious what your experiences have been. I was talking, I was thinking about how this product sort of like hardens the exterior of the plant, but it doesn't make it uh, immune. Sort of like going back to the, I guess, home security concept earlier. Um, most homes are technically able to be broken into, uh, even if you have a bunch of defense, but there are things that you can do to make your home less likely to be broken into, especially if you're a grower. Like some simple things like um, reinforcing your door so it can't be kicked in as easily with uh, heavier screws. Or if you have like a glass window, they make like hurricane proof things. So if it was to be hit, it wouldn't shatter and, and break in as easily. Uh, cameras on the exterior of your house. That's something that prevents even fake cameras. You can buy fake cameras on Amazon and uh, thing, although that won't necessarily protect you, it might ward off some people. The thing I really like is a real camera and like a motion light. So if somebody comes with in a certain area of your home, it basically activates a spotlight, which startles most people uh, or even animals. And then you can have that area be captured by a camera. And um, I think that will deter at least some people, not everybody, obviously, but there are steps that you can make uh, that your house goes from like a soft target to more of a hard target for somebody who would be wanting to do some harmful or uh, negative action towards you. I know it's probably an insufferable way to put this, but like be hard to hurt, you know, just try to do that. Try, try to make yourself not an easy target. Um, I know so that's not, I hope nobody takes that as victim blaming because even I have trouble doing that too. Like I said, behaviorally, I want to reach out to people a lot more, but sometimes I feel like I can't bring myself to do that without like making myself or putting myself in a vulnerable position. And I think a lot of people can relate to that. To like kind of relate it to a different topic. I, I like cars and the engineering of vehicles and the more pieces that you have in a car, the more likely it is to fail. And I guess like the more people that you involve in your group, and this maybe sounds a little bit cynical. I think that like 99% of people are good, but like there's that 1% of people out there, maybe it's bigger, maybe it's smaller, who knows, maybe optimistic, but the more people you add to your group, the more likely you are to have 
part of that 1% join, whether they seem like it on the surface or not. Um, so that's why I think a lot of people, um, especially if you've had somebody cross you in the past, it can be difficult to be trustworthy of uh, strangers. So I think it's a lot of people take time to build that trust and uh, definitely don't open up their circle super quickly where other people are just kind of desperate for approval and will hang out with anybody and everybody. So it's uh, important. I think a lot of people judge you by the character you keep. And uh, I've heard that like you can judge your success of your life if you look at like the five people closest around you. And uh, there's a lot of um, things to be learned about you know who you surround yourself with. So I'm very thankful to be on such a wonderful panel this this week and many other weeks. I have a very diverse group of individuals who have a lot of different skills. So it's always awesome to have you all on here. Well said, Jack. You know what? That statement completely recovers your your two weeks of absence in my mind i love you buddy <laughs> i hope you had a good vacation too like we missed you i did man I, I had a great vacation um it was my first year my dad's birthday he wasn't here with us he passed last year of uh, complications from covid and it's been tough on the family he was like the uh, patriarch he was kind of the leader of the family and a big character and huge uh, role in my life and my mom and my brothers and sister and it's been tough, but um, my two brothers both had their first child, and I got to play Uncle Jack over the 4th of July weekend up through, uh, I think I came back on the 12th, so it was cool. I got to see my uh, one brother's kid for the first time ever. Uh, she was stuck over in China because the pandemic. Uh, she was there for Chinese New Year and ended up getting stuck and wasn't able to travel back and was stuck there for over a year. Um, she's native Chinese, but... Um, wow. that's his fiance and I was really thankful to get to meet her and interact with her and it was really really cool um, thankful it was uh, reminded me of seeing your daughter as well uh, getting to play with her I, I like interacting with the young kids I think that they're a really uh, interesting you know curiosity at such a young age so much potential I have a granddaughter on the way here in the next three months and I'm very excited to meet her Congratulations, Noah. It's awesome, man. You're like a smiley, man. You're, you look young for a grandpa, but uh, it's a good thing. It's a uh, family's growing and those kids, once they start crawling, it's only a matter of time until they're walking and you know, chasing around for the rest of their life is what smiley always says. And it seems to be true. Thankfully, I don't have any myself. It's fun to play uncle, get to tap in, uh, have fun with them, play around. And then uh, when I'm all done, I can just like, you know, walk away. It's not my responsibility. They get That's to take my back over. That's my move, Jack. I get totally high on Thanksgiving, hang out with my nephews, play like a little kid. It's the best. And then I go home. Don't have to worry about it. <laughs> it is certainly nice. Uh, I love my uh, fur children, my cats, but I don't have any uh, human children and no plans to. But uh, cheers to Crispy Wannabe and Cheddar Bob 13, Stony Creek, RP. Lots of good people in the chat this week. 132 of you with us. I want to remind you all to hit that thumbs up. There's only 30 people who've done it so far. I hadn't done it yet myself, so I was just a uh, absent-minded stoner there for a little bit. But if you're enjoying the show, make sure to hit that thumbs up button. I'm happy to be back. I always enjoy the show, even when I'm not on it. I listened to it, and I did a little write-up. For anybody who listens on the podcast, I'm sorry that it was a little bit delayed, but I did do my write-up, and I posted it to all the podcast platforms. So hope the uh, people who listen after uh, get to enjoy that. So I'm thankful that we're able to keep on doing that. The podcast is actually listened to probably two to three times as much as uh, the YouTube is viewed both live and after the fact. So it's uh, definitely a split audience, but I think some of those people are actually uh, both. Like they might watch live and then also listen to the podcast. And I think that some of them are just completely independent. So very thankful for everybody who does come back and listen each week. Matt had a post on his thing that said, uh, this is like weeks ago, that said 400,000 uh, plays. I was like, wow, I can't believe we've, we've reached that many people already. Yeah, man, it's been going on for a long time. If you think about like, uh, that even includes like the individual episodes way back with like uh, the Josie Wales interview, uh, all of our individual interviews. Like if you go through Stitcher, it has all the original episodes still up there. Um, a lot of them are on all the podcast platforms, but like only from like, I think it's like episode 82 of this week or the show and forward are on there. But um, yeah, there's that's a lot of uh, people. I think it's a little over a thousand each week, and I think we're at like 407 k or something now. So we're coming up to that 420 k. So when we get that, I'm definitely gonna screenshot <laughs> 420 k. And then the next goal uh, is 710, and then a million. So shit, I think it's possible. We've been uh, cruising along steadily, you know, keeps ticking up, and uh, 
we're only getting more people each week. So even when I didn't show up for a week and then showed up, you know, several minutes late last week, we've got a hundred plus with us live this week, which is amazing. I uh, love this chat. <laughs> Major General 420 earlier, he said, give me that Downey burger. And if you weren't in Canada, if you were here in the US, I would totally give it to you. But unfortunately, the laws are uh, not in the place where I could give it to you quite yet. And it's funny because you've been saying that to me ever first interacted in any chat on anywhere before there was equal show or here or somewhere else. Uh, so it's funny that I'm not actually keeping the Donnie burger female <laughs> that uh, I ended up uh, popping from seed. So my buddy still has a cut of it, although he thinks it might have hoplite and viroid, which is kind of a motherfucker. And I think it's about $7,000 to scrub that right now through tissue culture and uh, heat and cold treatment process. Unless Matthew, do you, do you know of anybody who's doing that for cheaper or at all? I know a guy in Massachusetts is doing it cheaper if anyone's up this way. I don't off the top of my head. It's the sort of thing that like um, there are there aren't a whole lot of people that are doing it or that are offering it. And I think that like you say, it's also like extremely exorbitantly expensive. So I'm not sure it would even help a lot of people here. There are I, I like starter kits on Amazon for like 250 bucks that are like minus the hood. Um that are like tissue culture kits, 250 bucks. And it's like the, the, the appropriate solutions and vials and stuff like that. So you can, can make it yourself for, for like 50 bucks. Raptor grow breaks down. Um, there's a book called plants and test tubes. My goal, my, I try to do like a new year's resolution as corny as that may be each year. And my goal this year is to learn how to do tissue culture myself. And I'm trying to, and uh, still studying and, and learning a lot of the back end process. I need to get more hands on with it, but he broke down that, $250 kit and how to make it yourself for $50. And um, it's like agar is a solution and he tells you all the hormones and all the other little things that you might need. Um, but it is definitely affordable to do at home. And he suggests doing it in the bathroom because most of the surfaces in the bathroom are meant to be cleaned and sterilized. So they're easy to clean and sterilize. And so once you get that, he does it in a stagnant room, but some people do it in like a tent where they have a either like a carbon filter or they'll make like a laminar flow hood. <laughs> Those are really expensive though. So um, if you know mycology or how to grow mushrooms uh, or work with mushrooms, then I think that tissue culture will be a breeze for you because both of those things require being highly sterile and uh, working in a you know non-contaminated environment. But I do believe that it's something that people can learn how to do on their own. The heat treatment and cold treatment are something that I think I need to do more research into because that is something that I hear for the hoplite and viroid um, that people are interested in doing to get rid of it. And that's what I believe um, the group out here, who is that? Dark Heart Nursery. They were the one who basically famously gave it out to a bunch of people. I think it was Gorilla Glue 4 that they had that had dudded or hoplite and viroid. And they found it out and then they figured out how to fix it. And now they're like selling the cure to the disease. I think they were doing it for 10K. Another group did it for like 8 or 9K. And now there's a group doing it for 7K. Uh, Kyle, do you know how much they're charging over there? Because the one thing with uh, clones is with hemp being legalized in all 50 states, we could actually send plant tissue uh, culture, whether it's a clone or a small snippet to mass and have it scrubbed there, if uh, that is the case. Yeah, so ironically, it's funny that you bring that up. So I was actually gonna, um, at one point, this is actually really recent in the last couple of months, I just didn't bring it up to anybody, but I was gonna try and get into that business myself, learn it, because the guy's teaching you everything for five for five or seven actually i think it's seven grand he's willing to do it for me for five for like a business relationship but i think it's like for seven grand he'll teach you how to do it you go into his he's got like a whole uh he's like renting a place in like a college or somewhere where you can go there he, he suits you up put you know all you need you have your own little station uh teaches you how to do it for seven grand which um and um but what, what i was wondering is I'm like man if i could just instead of just giving people seeds why would i just give them the actual cuts and if i could do it in tc form I mean, how more legal can you really get? Because you're just looking at like, you know, a piece of uh, vegetative material, you know? And I, and I called, I talked to a patent lawyer in California about some of that stuff. And he's like, well, okay, you know, it's, it's still, it's basically you're playing with fire. So it's like, how much risk do you really want to do? And uh, I don't know, he kind of pushed me away from that thought because that's what I was thinking, Jack. I think that'd be, you know, if I could give people TC cuts of my, of my phenos, I mean, what better way you know, would that be? But uh, in regards to, uh, so I'm not really big on like shouting people out, but if you look up, Tananomical Laboratories on Instagram. Um, he's a, he's a pretty cool kid, and uh, if you reach out, he'll you know tell you the class. Actually, there's the website too. I think it's Canada. I follow them. Yeah, if you go on there, they have a yeah, they got a website. They'll tell you how much it costs and all the price. Because I don't know off the top of my head what the prices are, but it's 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 extremely reasonable. I don't think I think it might be like 
a grand dude that he'll like take the, the cut and like and uh there's Mary Stem and then there's like regular TC. He'll do the TC for like cheap, like it's affordable. Um, so I would look into it if anyone's actually curious about that. Definitely gonna look into it. My buddy was saying he would pay like up to three grand because uh, he has a few people that run the cut and they're all kind of bummed out because it was killing it for a while and it's kind of fallen off recently. Um, but yeah, definitely really interested to learn more about it and uh, potentially have- You know what? That was a really interesting business plan that Dark Art Nursery did that. We'll release this viroid. Everybody will get it, and then we'll figure out a cure. Be sure the first part you wasn't said intentional. What was though. on my mind, dude? Tal, you but it kind of seems a little bit like something else that's going on currently. I was about to America. say, when is this shit going to get related to the current pandemic? I, but I'm that's just all I'll say on that subject. But yeah, I want to go back to, the, weird, right? to, Here, to not let, to get too me, conspiratorial. Uh, I want to. Kyle had a point I, where he was talking about tissue culture clones, and I want to slip in there before we change topics entirely. Um, there was another Massachusetts breeder who I won't name because I don't enjoy their work or approve of their business practices or etiquette, but uh, they had strains that they were selling through Strainly and Clonify that were tissue culture versions of their cut. So, um, yeah, one of them was a derogatory name for the female genitalia of the strain, so I won't get further into detail on it. But, um, yeah, I, I just... Uh, it's interesting that people have done that, gone with the selling the direct clone or a selected clone. And there are people that are doing it the right way, like um, Archive in Portland. He breeds a lot of really cool shit. <laughs> he occasionally finds a cut that'll do like, I don't know, do si -do across the do -si do and he'll get like do -si do F2 and like it'll be do -si do number 26, the do -si do number 73. And that cut just happens to be really fire. And then he'll put that one out in his shops up in Portland. Uh, I think Noah's got some stuff from Archive in the past. Uh, how are the a clones bunch. There, no? uh, uncomparable to anywhere else uh, really um, I mean if you get a cut from a buddy maybe but uh, even then you're still worried I've never gotten any bugs I've never gotten pathogens and uh, everything that they have is, is good uh, it's just you know obviously some are better than the other ones I've tried the Dosido -Do 55 I've tried the uh, Dosido F2. Um, I've tried uh, the Sherbido, where it's the Sunset Sherbert cross with Dosido. I've done, uh, I've, I've gotten a bunch of, of his stuff, and uh, yeah, they do it right over there. It's definitely cool growing just a bunch of different clones out. It's almost like popping a bunch of different seed packs, but they've already done the hunting for you and have hopefully found a keeper. And in his case, I do believe that uh, from all accounts, and I've even had some archive stuff in California that's been pretty uh, respectable. So it's cool that he's putting his work out there that freely, because a lot of people are really tight with their clones and want to keep them close to the chest and not let them out. And uh, I understand why it's a sustainable competitive advantage. If you have a unique strain that's different, that puts you in the market where you can say like our stuff smells like this or looks like this or tastes like this, that's different than whatever else is available. then that can be something uh, people want to keep, you know, hidden uh, other than for their own production. But unfortunately, a lot of the stuff gets out or even if it doesn't, it gets uh, falsely recreated. So people just start calling like gelato, whatever the hot strain of the day is. Uh, even if it's not that strain. So a lot of people think, oh, you know, it's okay. Or maybe it's, it's like gelato. <laughs> and if you like gelato, then you like the new hype strain. And if you don't like gelato, then you're like, man, that shit's terrible. Uh, so there's a lot of fishiness going on with the industry in regards to that. So hopefully we this see is, less of that moving forward. I mean, I totally agree. I mean, this is, for me, I feel the same way, whether or not somebody's trying to advise me I mean, it's, it's a much less magnanimous thing, but like when people are like trying to say, oh yeah, sure. They're just trying to sell me on something. Oh, it's like X, Y, Z, or, oh, you can order this or order that, you know, like, cause they're just trying to like make you do something that'll, you know, give them money for the business or whatever, you know, or, or, or even if they're just trying to, to sort of convince you of something. I, I don't know. I just feel like all of that is just sort of dishonest and it's really gross, but like it happens all the time. And, and some would say it's sort of just fundamental to like communication. There's a really funny like door-to-door -door salesman. Uh, he's an African-American gentleman uh, in the U S and he goes door-to-door -door and he just has like these really quick one-liners and he's super funny. And I saw Wolverine, I think it was Wolverine grown. He's a, for those who don't know, he does a lot of consulting. He set up a bunch of, uh, 
basically larger indoor grows. He uses like HLG lights. And I think he is sponsored by uh, certain nutrient companies. And one of the lines that the guy says, he's like, do you got some water? And the people are like, yeah. He's like, oh, good. You're already qualified to use it. And the dude was just talking about like, he's trying to, he was going door to door selling a cleaner, a little cleaning product in a bottle. And he he's really entertaining. So if people haven't seen the video yet, look up like world's funniest door to door salesman. And uh, he's got his own YouTube and everything now. And uh, I think it's worth watching. I'm a, most people that enjoy cannabis enjoy comedy and he is legit like a comedian. So I think people will enjoy those clips if you haven't already seen it. Cause it's, I think it's Jason really Eisenstone gets, yeah, I think Jason Eisenstone here in the chat gets it. It's just persuasion is rhetoric and like, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's communi communication with chemicals and microbes and plants is the same. It's still communication at the end of the day, what we do verbally you know, we interact with each other. It's like programming. We're, pro we're programming the environment if I wanted to sound really uh, abstract and esoteric about it. But that's, it is kind of true at the end of the day. Um, and some people are susceptible to different kinds of code for lack of a better way to put it. I have a random topic that I want to bring up because I just went on vacation for 12 days and I didn't have anybody plant sit and using the earth box, I transplanted in the day that I left as late as I could, like we delayed it, delayed it, delayed it as long as I could, watered really thoroughly with a Chapin sprayer where it's like a little pump sprayer, watered from the top, and I gave it water from down below, filled up the reservoir. I came back 12 days later and the plants were beautiful, healthy as fuck, green, lush, weren't drooping at all. Uh, I'm gonna try and email myself the picture of before and after to show off basically how effective the earth box can be um but i'm curious like um i guess i'll pass it to the american one what's the if you were going to go on vacation how long are you comfortable leaving your plants without a sitter or an automated watering type thing i went away for four days is the most and i did it exactly like you i i had everything timed to where the day the night or the day that i left i transplanted everything i upplanted everything so that definitely did good i came back there was no uh harm no foul Two of them were drooping a little bit, but that was it. Well, everything was green and happy and uh, had no deaths. But um, yeah, it's really hard when, like we were talking about security, if you don't tell anyone, there's no one that you could, you know, and even if you do tell people, people I've trusted, I left them with my plants and they screwed me over. So I really am, uh, I don't like putting anything that's important in the hands of other people. It's part of my problem too, though, because yeah. They always say you need a team, but yeah. <laughs> it's tough, man, because I'm like you, uh, even the few people that I do trust, the one time I have two plant sitters that I will implement if I absolutely have to. And one of them uh, lost their privileges essentially because they, I wrote out a single page, like eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper. Here are the instructions. Here's what you do. I basically, I even had the nutrients like pre squeezed out into little pipettes so all I had to do is like squeeze it into the water, mix it up, pour it. Uh, just one, one out of the three feeds. They ended up giving plain water every single time in cocoa. And they just like flushed the entire <laughs> vacation. So I, I left with luscious, green, healthy plants. And I came home with the yellowest plants you could possibly ever have. And uh, so definitely learned my lesson there. And I'm curious, passing it over to Aaron, because I know you go to Oklahoma. And sometimes your wife comes with you. Sometimes she doesn't. How long are you comfortable uh, traveling? uh with leaving your garden behind oh, this is such a hard hard question to answer um to be honest like fucking 10 hours dude i do not like leaving my plants i'm obsessed with them but when i have to go to oklahoma for a significant amount of time my wife stays home and i go by myself and i get shit done for weeks away from my plants and then i gotta get home and i got a lot of thinning to do and i gotta feed like you said but living soil is a little bit more forgiving than cocoa in that regard in terms of feeding, you can just flush, 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 and they'll just, they have enough food to get through. But yeah, that's my experience. I love my plants. I don't like to leave them ever. Yeah, I, I, I figured you would say something similar to that. I, I do feel like, at least for me, um, I have a difficulty even with like pets and things like that. Not that they have any right now, but uh, yeah, I, I'm very responsible. <laughs> so I really don't like the idea of leaving for an extended period of time. I don't have a plan in place. It's yeah, I'm a control. I think I have control issues is really what it is. Like I can't trust anybody to 
to water my plants even. So, except for my wife, obviously my wife can do a really good job, but she's highly trained. Right. So it's, it's hard to trust me, but what are you looking at there, Jack? This is some of the American ones, Amy aces. I put two of the females that I vegged out into the earth box. This is, and like I said, not the most impressive looking plant, but this is coming out of a one gallon pot transplanted into an earth box. And this is the day that I left vacation. Uh, and 12 days later with no watering other than the initial watering that I had, this is the, what I returned to. So I was definitely pretty happy. You could see that they're, they grew kind of straight up. <laughs> I had bent them over. Um, but yeah, the one on the left especially has those kind of thick fat, almost like uh, Afghani leaf. And the one on the right is definitely more of a narrow leaf. If you know, it's a little taller, uh, getting bent over a little bit more, but yeah, I was, they're a few inches taller than that now and got a few more nodes growing out of them but uh, was super happy to be able to come home to a healthy plant after 12 days. That was the longest I'd gone without having uh, watered plants and had <laughs> living uh, healthy, successful plants when I got back. Noah, I'm curious, uh, I don't think we've got to you yet. Uh, how long do you feel comfortable traveling for? What's the longest you've been away without uh, coming home to a disaster in your garden? Well, I was very lucky, man. My, of course, it, uh, it, it, my father-in-law was the best. Uh, he was really good at it. Uh, I went to Hawaii three times, once for two weeks, once for 10 days, once for nine days. But he passed away a couple of years ago, and it has been just touch and go. And I probably would say kind of like what Aaron says, like I, I really just – I leave my wife, and um, that's pretty much it. Uh, I do have a new trainee that I'm training and uh, trying to train. So it – Cause my setup is, you know, kind of difficult. I just, I don't write nothing down. You know, I don't got a feed chart. I just know what I'm going to, I do it. I live it just like Aaron said. I don't like to, I don't like to leave my plants. I'm very close. Uh, I'm wrapped up into it. You know, I, I love it. I love growing. So it is tough, but uh, yeah, I would say, you know, like right now I do three days. That's like the most, but two or three. Yeah. And honestly, that's not like a nice long weekend away. And it's at least something uh, somebody said they're a slave to their plants in DWC. I never like to feel like I'm a slave to the plants as much as uh, it might feel like that if you're having to be around them a lot and monitoring things. Because in DWC, technically things can go awry in a few hours. If your air stones, air pumps go out, you could be in really, really serious trouble in not a lot of time, uh, especially if the water is lower in the res of the yeah. DWC. I've seen issues where the person just went away, didn't even go away. They just didn't go visit their garden one day and the pump failed the day before and they didn't realize. So not even on vacation and they, they pretty much killed their stuff. But I was going to say, I realized I went away in December. Like if I was going to go away right now, I would, I would have to be back in two days because of the way this heat is and certain areas I don't have the AC, like I don't have a hundred percent. So yeah, depending on the time too, because they would definitely, uh, it would be different if I left right now. Well, Mine I mean, was I in asked, the middle of the fucking plants. summer. I asked my plants and they said, no, you can't go on vacation. <laughs> That's it. Yep. Right now, man, yours are looking pretty beastly. It'd be tough to leave. Definitely couldn't leave with you and the wife because those things would need some water probably later that day. They're freaking huge. Yeah. Hotter days, twice a day, man. Yep. It's impressive to see how they've... Uh, Basically, from when I came up on my honeymoon to see where they're at now in just a couple months, it's uh, insane, like 10x in size, at least. Yeah, man, it's been really remarkable. I think been a lot of good energy up there and and uh, malted barley and, you know, lots of bio live and calcium, you know, gypsum and oyster shell, um, lots of water, lots of lots of soil space. And lots of care. I'm at my garden four times a day, most, most days. Yeah. I feel like it's like some next level shit when you have plants that are like above, I don't know, six feet tall or just, you know, and you're just like anything plus that is like a whole nother skill set when you're dealing with shit like that. Yeah, like. bro. When I'm like setting up my scaffolding to scout the, the colas, that's, that's, that's different shit. That's not farming. That's, I don't know. That's half <laughs> right. construction or something, you know? <laughs> yeah. Right. The project. <laughs> Yeah. Mendo Dope's uh, sh uh, Johar plant is what they're using this year for the world's tallest. It's already over 10 feet tall. So that's going to be an in interesting project. Hopefully, fingers crossed, 
even though they say this year, like they do every year, California's going to have its worst fire season ever. Um, hopefully they don't get hit too hard in their area and hopefully they can grow the world's tallest plant or at least the tallest that they've ever tried to grow before. You know something? I wanted to actually compete in that, man. I got that Highland tie I have is like just a, a freak of nature in regards to height. And I would love to just build like a, just an extremely tall but skinny barn just so I can get the height and then throw it out like at like, you know, 30 feet in, into the spring and then see where that goes or something. If you grew it next to like a telephone tower or something, you know, like I've seen plants that like oh, are yeah. tall plants that grow up like a stop sign and they grow all the way up and they're like, like grass height type of plants and they figure out a way to work its way through because the light gets in there. I, wow. I imagine cannabis could get really fucking oh. tall. I've seen some photos that dwarf the Mendo Dope Boys plants, so I'll see if I can't find them. But I was wondering if it was real or not, how tall these things were. Remember that video I played from Katsu Bluebird's page? I'll, yeah, I'll I think that it. might be what I was... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was still I mean, what shaking what the fucking plant. Do you guys know what the current record is right now in regards to, like, in real, real facts? That's a great question. We should start the Cannabis World Book of Guinness Records. Right. I think it's like between 20 and 30 feet, I would guess. I've seen uh, so that's, that's personally. Beatable. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's beatable. There's photos of, of plants out there. I think like 15 to 20 feet is pretty realistic to believe. Um, I think Mendo Dopes last year got maybe over 16 feet, but they're already at 10. And uh, it, they're just growing it straight up. I've seen like 15 feet high and 15 feet wide. Some of these fucking Northern California and Oregon growers that are in oh, those yeah. thousand gallon pots are just straight in the ground. That bedroom from fucking last winter inside get a massive before they even go outside and just I don't know some of these things get huge. I think I'm at fourteen and a half or wait thirteen and a half feet tall and about seven feet long and six feet wide on that on that big big plant. In serious root structure. <laughs> just a, a lot, of, a lot of plant to trim. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, fuck me. Yeah. Wait, what's, your, what's your pruning session? A couple hours? <laughs> oh, a couple days. Yeah. No, like I said, yeah, I'm going to have to set up scaffolding, bro. So, like, yeah, I'm going to, you know, jump off, adjust it, jump back up, do my thinning. But the last week of flower, I stripped the plants of all their their fan leaves, right? But like a week before I harvest. And um, so I'm, I'm literally about to start that in the next day or two on the first couple of uh, more indica Afghani strains. So, oh, yeah, real excited. You're going to need some help down there. <laughs> I do. <laughs> I'm still enjoying that Garanimals that you gave me, that uh, rosin sample. I dab it like all the time. and It just the pile barely ever seems to get smaller. And I'm taking Dude, badass you- dabs you've kept it longer than I have. I had like a fucking 20 gram slab of that. And I don't know, I chunked you off just a, an eyeball three or four grams, you know? And yeah, I smoked through that already. It's gone. <laughs> I love that shit, dude. Granimal is one of my favorite strains. I actually got it tattooed on me because it's just the actual bud that I, my favorite bud that I ever grew was Granimals. And I took a picture of it, took it to uh, OPTs, the guy who did the Sublime logo, had him tattoo it on my arm. So it's pretty cool. Are you going to fucking camera on and show us now or is this oh god be, no you know is it somewhere yeah, you can see it. yeah it's on my instagram no way dude no way it's not on your that. like penis or anything right it's on my penis it's 100 on my yeah, penis it's on the inner thigh <laughs> yeah no, check it out on my instagram Scro- stock my instagram you can find it lower it's, back I tattoo like i see it oh the tramp stamp <laughs> inner arm it's like my inner except for whatever I'm still scrolling, looking for that Katsu post. I think he's got like thousands of posts, but maybe I'll find it. Yeah, so I'll yeah, throw I'm, I'm down yeah. to grow one of those big ones, man. That's we could fucking we could put up a silo and just uh, yeah, dude. Know, I got like that a, land race. I got that land race life. Yeah, fucking, no, I get that just tell as fuck. And I was just even thinking right now, if you just keep cleaning up the bottoms, that thing's gonna focus on the top, so it'll just keep getting tall as shit. If we're going for height. That's it. Yep, that's it, man. Yep. I mean, that tie thing, that dude, no lie, that tie that I grew, I know you guys already know about it, and I've brought it up a million times, but that thing had a, a times eight stretch in flower. So, it, man, it would make it. It's like, how long can a plant grow? It's like, could we go for like three years? You know, how long could we? We need like, we need like six yards of soil for one plant 
and we just need to let it go for for years and years and years right i think it's doing i found a, a pretty large example I'll, uh, I'll drop the link in the chat to you, Jack. So if you want to check All it right, out. Yeah, I've got one. I, that I, wonder, I, I just found that's pretty fucking big. I wonder how big this one is. It's hard to tell because the guy might be on his like one knee or something, but check this one out. I'm going to share screen. I'll show mine and then I'll show off the house. So this is another one from Katsu's Bluebird page. Um, pretty impressive. I'd guess this guy's between five and six feet tall, that plant is easily right. double his height probably uh closer to yeah, 16 to 20 feet yeah i'd, I'd agree with that and then we're okay. gonna go over that's to the that's zoom flowering yeah it is it dude that's not even flowering that's right now it's this season is that recent no i, I scrolled way back so that's a oh, okay. thing i'm gonna pull up the american ones in a different tab so that i don't lose my place Oh, this is the this is the exact, literally the post I was looking for, Tao. So I'm gonna go ahead and share screen. There you go. Yeah, that's uh, pretty damn tall, right? And then the next thing that I'm gonna go through is I want to show off some of the Afghan selections page because I know Kyle was talking a little bit about land race, and I feel like that page just doesn't get enough love. But here's the DNA genetics post. Uh, I said it was on Katsu Bluebirds page. It's I don't think it's either of their actual plant. It says uh, it all starts from a seed. Lemon OG. Going triple overhead bra and getting a shake Crazy. and a little rain. How tall do you think that one is? That's over feet. twenty feet. Yeah, yeah, that's a big ass. Uh, yeah, 25, 25, 24, 25 feet. Yep. And I know I have other ones that are larger than that, um, but not on IG. They're like from web pages. <laughs> I gotta, I'll go find them. I gotta find them now. I'm, I'm gonna be one of those fat ass nugs that fell down and hit him in the head. Yeah, look at that. That, that top nug got to be three feet long, right? Damn. Crazy man, yeah. Um, there was a Mullumbimbi and Madness is allegedly like can get up to like twenty to thirty feet tall. I think it's a wild like Australian strain. So I'm curious to see if the American one if you find anything else. But uh, that was definitely some, that was the post that I was looking for. And crazy impressive how large that plant was. Somebody just messaged me about that. They were telling me when I because I have some Australian uh, heirloom or land raised varietals that somebody sent me and. Somebody posted it, something really knowledgeable that I had no clue about saying that because of the extreme prohibition or not prohibition, but some kind of laws that there are in Australia, that a majority of Australia's uh, varieties are like from like Southeast Asia or something like that. So it, it's like an untampered gene pool and that it could be, you know, there's a lot of good material in there. Um, so I'm just wondering if any of you guys have heard anything like that. I recently That's posted true. about... Um some research regarding that about uh, the can the northwestern domestication or the in northwest what is now with northwest china about twelve thousand years ago um is where they're thinking is the first domestication that happened and then multi-purpose use i'm just quoting a couple of lines you should really look at the entire uh, paper but they're saying four thousand years ago or so which is pretty recent it's pretty wow. recent it's pretty recent when I think about it. Well, and if you just think about where Australia is located, Southeast Asia, I mean, it makes sense as far as distance traveled. It's not very far apart. Um, they both had other, somewhat other shaky plants, histories. Other cannabisi have gone to Australia, or, or at least I think they've crossed the Wallachia line. So Good to know. This was the uh, Afghan page I was talking about. These are just a few of the varieties, the Kash, uh, Kundos. Kushkak, I'm probably fucking mispronouncing the hell out of these. Rustam, Kush, and Sholgar from the Balkh province. Uh, this page, Afghan selection, it's really, I used to think of all Afghanis as being the same. But then you go to this page and you look at different ones and they have really, uh, like this is Baharak. And it's got like a kind of uh, more lavender-y purple, uh, some darker leaves. It's, it's definitely a wider leaf variety, but they have some taller plants. A lot of people think of Afghanis as only being short, squatty indicas, so to speak. Uh, here's a video of one that's definitely a taller plant, a little bit more narrow leaf. And yeah. it says the Mazar, uh, grown by Baba879, who is a great account to follow. He has a lot of really cool hash posts over there, the Baba879. And this page in general just shows off a lot of really uh, awesome traditional Afghan. This is a like more like a seed. It is a seed bank. They do uh, sell seeds through a few, the Attitude Seed Bank being one of them. But you can see the Baharak, Kash, uh, Kundos, 
Sholgar. The Sholgar's got a totally different color. It's more of the darker color versus the Kundos is a more traditional green. And the Rustam Kush and uh, Kushkak. <laughs> That's kind of a funny name if I'm pronouncing it correctly. But um, yeah, there's they have really cool descriptions too of uh, each one. If you go onto their page, definitely uh, some great information. Uh, they give a little write up. Uh, Bobo's page is actually probably a little bit better. This is cut off. Or maybe it's a two part post and I have to scroll. There it is. And it, it just kind of talks about like, this is the cave of snakes. It's a dry desert area. Um, talks about basically uh, some of the resistances of certain plants. And Kyle was talking about like uninterrupted parts of the gene pool. I mean, looking at some of this stuff is really amazing. I've brought up this post in the past and somebody gave them a hard time because it's like so brown or black. Uh, Oregon elite seeds or organ hybrids or like what about molds potential molds and uh, I bet the cannabinoid profile that is like extremely rare dude and all some of that stuff man yeah so here's a comment that really uh, gets into a good conversation Oregon elite se seed says why are some of the buds so dark it looks old not trying to be disrespectful just curious as to why it has that look um, that does not mean it looks like a crop it was just like oh no disrespect meant and then I go to view replies and then we'll see the description given by Afghan selection um, which, oops, damn Instagram, making shit difficult. It says, uh, question is totally legit. Some farmers let the hash cure on the plant while it's standing and don't cut until all plants are finished for a more mature hash. And we, as we view it, a broader spectrum in the overall feeling. So uh, sort of and kind I'll of what say, that was alluding to. Looking at that, I'll say that, you know, it's there's snow on the ground there. It's not like these things are in 100 degree weather, like getting crispy. This is probably like well-preserved um, cannabinoids. Yeah, some cold cured like terps. I bet you that's terpy as shit when it comes down to it. Um, so definitely. Personally, I wonder about page. it. Not, not, to be the, not to be like anti-traditionalist or anything, but I wonder, I feel like maybe... Yeah, I don't know. I feel like it wouldn't be a great smoke to be on. Just the flower is not good smoke. The hash oh, is good 100%. smoke. Yeah. I oh, right. Yeah. I, okay. I don't even know. I, is, so is the hash mm. a good smoke? Do you know that? From all, I mean, the stuff that I had that was imported from Afghanistan and much, much later and much more contaminated was great, even still by today's standards. And okay. so the, the stuff, and I mean, if you look through a lot of these guys' posts, it's melty if you see their like higher grades of stuff, they have like melt videos showing off how basically high quality some of the hash that they have is, um, but I'm going probably the wrong direction. And I should probably go to Baba's page, but here's a example of like their dry sift setup. And it's just a few people, but um, the amount of work that these people have been doing for years and years, they really have a solid understanding of how to make solid hashish and they have different grades. This is an interesting post here too, where you can see it like black leaf in the snow, like Aaron was kind of talking about. Um, it does preserve. I mean, fresh frozen is a, a thing that people rave about today. And you are seeing some of that represented in at least the Afghan culture. There are several half hashish cultures, including India that I'm not focusing on or, or representing right now. But um, the ancient way has definitely taught us a lot. And I think Frenchies brought some things from the old ways into the sort of uh, more modern methods and traditions. I, I love to talk about hash, and so I was just happy to highlight that page because Kyle was talking a little bit about land race, and I, I don't think enough people have um, made themselves aware of the different varieties that come out of Afghanistan. It's not just a short, stocky, uh, gas-smelling indica plant. There are some that smell fruity. There are some that smell um, like a whole bunch of different things. So uh, skunky, they've got fuel. They've got a whole bunch of different varieties over there. So uh, Afghanistan is rich with different varieties, just like the U.S. and Amsterdam and many other cannabis uh, forward countries. I'd like to, so I'd like to see like a, a, a lab result from like the true Afghani to like what we consider like a Kush Indica today and look at like the radical difference of the cannabinoid profile between the two. I would guess just based on the stuff that I've seen a little bit lower THC and maybe some CBD in some of the varieties. A lot of the stuff that came here to the U.S. we bred up in THC. So we took a lot of their stuff was the fastest finishing, heaviest yielding, and uh, American breeders and breeders in the Netherlands have bred it for high THC um, for a while, so much so that we almost thought we had lost CBD entirely. Um, and that's like rehash the whole Ringo's gift and um, Charlotte's Web, but there were only a handful of CBD strains just five years ago. 
and now there's hundreds of them but for a while it was like you couldn't find anything that wasn't like 20 to 30 percent thc and no cbd it was just all basically high thc cannabis I'm certainly happy to see that there's variety. I know uh, Kingdom Aquaponics just posted. He saw some, I should pull it up, but I'm too lazy right now. Uh, some posts saying that there was like 110 different varieties identified that are unique enough or different enough from each other that they can do original breeding. Uh, so I definitely think that it's cool and optimistic, but I was kind of like, my thought was like, duh, <laughs> there's so many places that are, as much as stuff gets touched that are semi left untouched. And in this case, um, cannabis like, Afghanistan is just one of the many countries that has, this is just one set of people that have documented a few different varieties. Um, if you go all over Afghanistan, I'm sure you'd find many, many more. And that doesn't include all the other Morocco and uh, India and other countries in, in those areas that are and have been producing hash for hundreds or thousands of years. So I think that there's still tons of variety out there as much as we worry that we've diluted the gene pool because people like greenhouse seeds go and they pick out some of these varieties and they give them our modern varieties. And then some of these people choose to grow just the modern variety and throw out all their old stuff. But a lot of them still have the old stuff. And uh, if they don't, maybe their dad or grandpa has it in a stash somewhere. And a lot of that seed is either viable or able to be tissue cultured. So I think that the hope is not gone. I think we're just at the tip of the iceberg on the breeding thing. I want to pass it over to Kyle and uh, see if you, anything new and exciting is coming out from your projects. I saw you post something about Cinderella 99 crossed with uh, New England rock candy, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. So I got a buddy of mine who's been uh, running a lot of uh, Mr. Soul's stuff. And, uh, you know, he had uh, the Cinderella 99 and he took his mail and hit it with my New England rock candy. And uh, basically, I was just, yeah, just doing like a limited release for anybody that's interested in that. Uh, if you're listening and you're interested in that, feel free to check out my email or email me at predicatedbreeding at gmail.com. Um, but yeah, I have a, uh, I think I basically went through my old stock and, uh, some stuff that no one really knew I had. And, uh, so I'm doing a, a seed drop, uh, this Friday for anybody that's interested of some new material that no one's seen and, um, which would be really exciting for people to get their hands on that stuff. Uh, but in the meantime, I currently have a, a four by eight tent full of, uh, all my phenos that I've been found from last year. And, uh, they're all pregnant right now with, uh, green Bodie's hazy Kush fem pollen that he had sent me. Uh, and there's definitely seed growth because I can see them just starting now. So that's really exciting as well. Um, so, yeah, yeah, we should see. I got some, some root beer. I got a root beer by GMO cut from uh, Skunk Tech and Mean Gene from Mendocino, like a personal breeder's cut that got sent to me that I uh, got. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I have some pretty exciting shit coming on. So if anybody's interested, uh, just uh, reach out to me or I should be. I'm dropping that Friday. That, that's new seed drop. So if anybody's interested in that, just let me know. What was the one that you mentioned right before me and Gene? Uh, it, I'm not sure. I have, so I have some, well, what's in the tower now? I have a uh, Fino, that's strawberry sugar cookies. I have New England rock candy sitting there. I have uh, uh, my personal cut of lime Marillo that I found through Brandon Seed Pack. That's like wicked fire. Um, uh, I have that root beer by GMO that I got from Skunk Tech and Mean Gene. Um, they did like a raffle and I got inside of that and, and, and got it. Um, I have some, uh, princess Elsa, which is interesting. I know you guys, I don't know if you guys all remember her. Well, she's back. Um, and, uh, so, uh, yeah, I just have, I have a bunch of really cool stuff in there. Oh, I have some Mac one breeders cut too, that got pollinated by that. So that should be an interesting cross. You know, how I see that stuff comes out. The hazy Kush is what caught my ear. Actually. Um, I used to work at a delivery service and we moved a lot of the, uh, green Bodie gear. Um, his stuff was really popular among our patients, Hazy Kush, Golden Pineapple, and a few of his other varieties, um, just pretty solid smoke in my experience. So I'm happy to see you working with him and uh, his gear. So it'll be cool to see what your varieties do with theirs. And uh, Mean Gene's pretty awesome too. So the GMO, root beer, all that good stuff. Those crosses I think are going to be exciting for the people. Um, the one thing I'm curious about Cinderella 99, that's one that kind of um, I'm a big fan of. What about Cindy 99 stands out to you and uh, why is that something that you want to work with? Uh, well, to be honest, well, ironically, I have a cigarette box. I know, I think you guys remember this or not, but I have a cigarette box that was gifted to me from a grower from somewhere that had a, a, a white paper in it. And you can look through my feed and see it. And it was a note from Mr. Soul back like in the early 2000s that said, you know, here's uh, basically Cinderella, uh, Cafe Girl, 
and basically all the shit that he like started with. And I don't, I, you know, I don't know the whole story. Anybody who like follows him or, you know, maybe deeper into that stuff knows all of his background uh, varieties, but I still have all, I literally have his original seed stock and I verified it through him. I said, I, I saw him at uh, the harvest club. I was like, Hey, does this note look familiar? He's like, yeah, yeah. That's my handwriting back in when I was in Europe. I, and I was like, yeah, well, I have these seeds still. And he's like, wow, you have, you know, he was just kind of surprised that I have like his original stock still. But, um, but yeah, in general, so yeah, all of his seeds, man, they're all uh, zero intersex issues, no matter what you did to them. So when it, in regards to stableness, uh, wicked good plants and just extremely consistent. I think Jack, I mean, you talked about this a while ago, or you showed me a link that, of his like breeding schedule and how he kind of got to where he, uh, you know, th those, uh, the stability of those plants. Cause he has like a whole, uh, Punnett square diagram of what he did in, in specifics, but, uh, just really, really stable plants, really uh, vigorous plants. Uh, basically for the most part, identical plants, no matter how many you pop and just really good material to work with. I have to ask now that I just thought about it, um, was the name Cinderella at all an inspiration for when you named the strain Elsa? No. Uh, well, maybe, you know what? Maybe, maybe there's like some like uh, subconscious decision about that. Uh, that's, that's a, yeah, probably. Cause I, cause I was, was really the logic for Cinderella. So he had a, um, he got, it was a Jack Herrera Fino and he had one that he called princess because it was the best of, there was like four bag seeds, right? He grew them all out of those females. Um, the one was clearly the best. He named that princess and to make Cinderella 99, uh, because when you do back crossing, like the first generation, I think you get 50%, uh, second generation, it's like 75 then it goes like 82, 88, but then you work your way up to, if you back cross enough times, it's like almost 99% the same DNA. And so he made his princess into a seed line. So that clone was taken through three or four back crosses into becoming, um, Cinderella 99. What's your, what's your favorite thing today, Jack? What's your, what, what's your thoughts on it? The high and the growth pattern. So some people, some people say it's way too racy. You, you like that? So I, I like to feel like, I don't know, maybe it makes me feel like I'm driving a car too fast. Like, yeah. uh, like my heart's racing. Like I'm living life on the edge. Like it's like an exhilarating feeling. Like it's just like, you feel like you're, I'm fucking alive. Like, I don't know. It's just like, uh, I feel the same like way. Those, up, uplifting, really functional. Uh, the first time that I had it, I was actually like, felt my heart kind of like thumping in my chest. So like reminding myself of like some of those new smokers who get paranoid, who think they're gonna have a heart attack, who think something's gonna go wrong. I'm like, oh, this is just really strong weed. I just need to take a breath, drink some water, maybe eat a snack and I'll be fine. Um, but a lot of people don't like that buzz. They uh, maybe have more stuff going on in their head. I think a lot of people it's, um, too introspective and if they're not happy with their life and what they're doing it'll make them think about all that shit that they're pushing off uh, but if you're happy with what you're doing and you're trying to you know live a good life and, and do everything the best you can then you don't have too much to panic or worry about um a lot of people have more responsibility than myself like having kids that that can be a big maybe they get in their head oh what's happening to my daughter or son or something that they can't control um so some cannabis gets people it's not for everyone i've always kind of said that cannabis in general but not every single strain is for everyone uh, I think that there is probably a strain out there for everyone if they took enough time to get to know cannabis in a good environment, but it's tough for people when they've had maybe like an edible experience where they eat way too much mm -hmm. and then it just feels shitty and uh, you're scared almost. I, I, I have to admit, I'm one of those people who likes to like sort of the, the energetic like vigor of like an energy drink, espresso coffee, you know, and also certain cannabis, um, you know, sessions. Definitely I can get that feeling and I get behind it. I'm still looking for that specific strain. And I think it's in like the nineties gear, to be honest. Uh, Cause some of the weed nowadays, I've told you guys before, like I miss just like getting high and taking my canoe out and going fishing and doing stuff but, like, man, I, there's something about the weed like that's rotating around now that I just like, it, it just gives me a different high and like, I don't like it. Like I get like, like partial anxiety or something. And it sucks. Well, I wonder if it's like, you know, maybe it's not the, I mean, maybe it's not the weed. I mean, it's possible. <laughs> I mean, as, as we, as we age, I mean, I perhaps it's better to say it's not just that maybe uh, that has changed a lot too, but um, we also do too. And um, I just, right. you know. Yeah. Cause like yeah. half my friends are still extreme potheads, you know, cause I was taking 
eight person gravity bong hits out of the bathtub with the big pull and spring commercial bottle and all that stuff. But, uh, you know, but then the other half of my friends are like in the same boat. They're like, yeah, I just get like anxiety now. So I don't know what, you know, something happens to like the endocannabinoid system as we get older or things just, you know, what, what the nervous system, like, and some, some people weaken, you know, I'm just, I'm just always kind of gonna, curious about you know what? I'm going to spin this around and say, maybe you're healed and you don't need cannabis anymore. Maybe. You know what I mean? I hope to get. But was to the, it ever about needing it in the first place? Well, for me, I medicate. I need it, and and I think I hope one day to get to a place where I don't need it anymore. And maybe you're just there, and your body's telling you you can slow down. Yeah, yeah I, I mean, I, like I think that. it's def- it's definitely true that the the body, you know, physiology can change for that. And some people, I forget where I was reading it. There was a um, there was a research report that was talking about like the interactions with cannabinoids. I think somebody was talking about it recently on like Instagram or something. And it was just interesting to see how like different people's like cytochrome, you know, P450 or whatever, like in their liver, those enzymes, you know, some people have, uh, you know, different enzymes that are mutated or they're just structured differently. And so they're better or worse at, at going through certain toxins, like the cannabinoids when we, when we um, uh, metabolize them. And that can have a lot of downstream effects. And as you age, your body will produce more or less of those or different ones, some, maybe not that latter one. But, um, you know, it definitely, you know, our, our age, our bodies, they all, they all change. Maybe I'm just cynical because of that, that recent knee injury, going for an MRI for it, actually. So we're going to find out what this phantom pain is all about. But, um, you know, things change. <laughs> I definitely think that things change. So does the cannabis. I mean by all accounts it's higher thc and that alone can be one of the more paranoia inducing elements of the cannabis um let alone like there's more terpenes maybe preserved in it where like a lot of the shit we used to get back in the day for people was brick it maybe wasn't as strong it was like shipped and it's old who knows how old who knows how potent where now it's maybe more locally grown grown with super high potency so one hit of a bong today might be like 35 hits of a bong in 2000 or something like that uh, who knows based on the potency of what you were smoking. And also I think we kind of t- touched on this in the past when we talked about this topic, but maybe your life and, and responsibilities have changed. Like maybe you have more things like your parents are older or somebody in your family is older that has more health issues or you have kids or a more uh, job responsibilities than you did when you were able to like fuck around in high school and take giant ass gravity bong hits and not worry about much um, or as much, so to speak. See, I have a very, I have a very poor idea of balance because some, I have two kinds of friends when it comes to cannabis. One group that is, uh, I would just describe as very regular use and other people who basically never touch it. And so like, for me, I feel, I always feel like no matter which group I'm talking to, I'm either the person who never smokes or the person who smokes quite a bit. Um, and there's no winning. So it's very hard to feel like that, that, uh, what do you guys think of that? Uh, I did a little bit of research, and maybe you guys know more than I do. But uh, that Delta Eight, apparently, you get you get the effects of getting high, but zero paranoia and anxiety from it. Yes, and it's like you can it's legal. Everybody it's reacts like, differently to that. it. I, it's oh, not like, that's the best part. That shit. No, I, I have I dude. First of all, Delta Eight, right? Like I made some RSO that was really high in Delta Eight, and I'm like, oh, this is gonna be great. You know, the lab lab results came back high. Delta Eight, thirty percent Delta Eight on this RSO. And I take it before bed, I fall asleep and I wake up and I'm like, what the fuck kind of dream did I just have? I mean, it's like a rocket ship to the moon of hallucinogens if you fall asleep on it. And then if you don't, you kind of get trippy anyway. It's like, that was my experience. But I know, like you're saying, Jack, everybody's got a different. uh, Yeah, people are calling it weed light or whatever, but it's not weed light at all. Like some people get really, really fucking high on it. And it's like, oh, they're trying to take it because maybe it's not regulated the same or it's not illegal, this or that. But uh, it'll definitely get people high, depending on how much they take and how pure it is. Um, if it is even Delta, Delta 8, some stuff might be being sold as Delta 8 that's Delta 9 or CBD or whatever other cannabinoid or non-cannabinoid. So be wary of where you're getting a lot of the shit because as it's not regulated, people are just selling it all 50 states. Although it's becoming, I think, illegal in some of the states now. Um, just be wary of who is producing it, how they're producing it who's growing the product. I mean, how is it even being made to Delta 8? Are they taking a bunch of CBD from hemp and doing chemical conversions? Like what, what is the process? That's true. 
I wanted to do a little wrap up on the Cindy 99 conversation because we talked a little bit about Princess. Princess was either a Jack Herrera, Hermy onto itself, or Mystery Mail is how it's listed here. Um, but the basically magic of the process is down here. You see Princess cross the Shiva Skunk. Mr. Soul talks about he outcrossed the Princess to the Shiva Skunk because Princess, although it had really good smoke, a great high and good smell, good flavor, all that, it had the kind of gorilla glue problem where it would snap on itself at the late weeks of flower, like week eight uh, to nine, it's buds would be so fat that they literally break off. So Shiva skunk is a kind of more indica plant for those who don't know. And it is uh, got good structure. So to outcross from the princess, he crossed the Shiva skunk creating what he called P50. Uh, that's the 50% hybrid I talked about earlier. First generation, about half of them are going to be like mom, half of them are going to be like dad. Uh, so P50 crossed the princess. So that's mom. 100%. And then you've got the basically P50, which is half of Princess, and that creates the P75. Uh, you do the same process over again, getting the 88 and all the way up to the 94. And the 94 gets crossed to the Princess for the Cinderella 99, just to walk you through the uh, back crossing process and how Mr. Soul made it. If you want to read through it, the long and dirty uh, seed finder, type in Brothers Grimm Cinderella 99. He talks through exactly the selection process uh, of cubing. And here it is, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, all that. And here's like the P50, P75, P88, all that good stuff explained. I think it's one of the more iconic strains. One of the things I was telling Kyle earlier that I really liked about it was the high and the bud structure. Um, it's a shorter, squattier plant, but it gives you a pretty uplifting high. So if you're in a small tent like I am and you want a sativa high, but you don't want a blue dream or a haze that takes like uh, 10 to 12, maybe even 16 to 18 weeks to finish and gets like three, four, maybe 10 X in height from its veg height. Um, you can go with a Cinderella 99 and get a nice uplifting high, but not have to have this plant that takes forever to finish grows really unwieldy and, and tall and difficult to manage. Uh, Cindy 99, I think is a true, um, testament to how well breeding can be done in cannabis. I think it's like, if you look at dog breeding and how iconic, like all the Cindy 99 that I've seen, they all look about the same. Um, they're short squat plants, nice thick buds, and um, the smell, that is something that varies based on, I think that I've come to find out that's more of an environmental signature, in my opinion. Um, but like with Velvet Punch, for example, I didn't breed it. My buddy Brad, the F1, he sent it to me. I have toed it. Um, I was looking for grapey, gassy phenos, and that's what I selected. That's what I bred with. I sent them out to a bunch of people. The American one's grown it. Uh, Spartan Grown's grown it. Uh, Eagle's grown it bunch of people have grown it now and all of them have found some phenos that are grapey or gassy or a combination of both so even though i think environmental impact and, and cultivation style lighting uh, soil and everything can play an impact on the smell and flavor um, i definitely think that the genetics um, can show through so mr soul is definitely a uh, badass and i'm going to pull up kyle just sent me the mr soul letter so i think that'll be cool to share because uh, definitely awesome that you have access to some of those earlier genetics and yeah I, I had asked him about it and he was like well i guess if you go somewhere on his website there's like a whole story of how it all began and that some of that material is that it says here's the breakdown uh g slash bro genius uh x her brother cafe girl cindy uh c88 so yeah a13 Apollo, I've heard of that one. Apollo, Apollo 13. 13, yeah, it's genius yeah. to the C75. So I have I have all those seeds in, in little baggies. Some of them don't look too well, but I think some of them are uh, salvageable. It'll be cool to see what you can get to pop, for sure. Um, tissue culture might be the way to go with some of them if you don't get them to go. I Definitely. think you had luck with the 70s and uh, 80s stuff, though, that you did with the... Um, Gibralic. Gibralic, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's definitely a process. There's a guy, that same guy that you follow, Jack, canonical for, I forget what we discussed for a price, but he said for some money that he's willing to basically do like a hormone gel to do an embryo saving. So, and he lives in mass. So I'm probably going to end up doing that with those just because they're like priceless. You know? I mean, that stuff that the breeder himself sold doesn't even have. And in that case, you could, uh, if you're the type of person to do this, reach out to Soul, uh, connect with him and maybe you know, get his hands on some of the best clones that you find and he might be able to work with some of that stuff and, and work it back to the stuff that he's working with now. I know he's still doing Cinderella 99 and selling those seeds on uh, brothersgrimseeds.com and a few other places. 
but um, I think it'd be cool to see what you find in that work. And if uh, you find something cool, it'd be awesome to see maybe some sort of collaboration with him uh, because That'd be cool he's hell. back in the game. Yeah, he's a good guy. I actually talked to him on the phone about some stuff. because I was wondering what people were getting for cuts, you know, because a lot of these comp- there's a lot of facilities. And if, you know, if you have a plant that's extremely valuable, some of these facilities, depending on where you are, Massachusetts is a little bit behind in this instance, but they're willing to give you uh, payout cuts. You know, you can either get percentage royalties off per harvest or they'll give you a straight cash uh, for the clone and basically own the rights to it. And I had Mr. Soul, like, let me call him personally. And we talked on the phone and you know, he's telling me like, you know, what numbers and, and what you should ask for. And uh, he's just a, a really good person overall. So follow him. He's a great dude. He uh, unfortunately like almost lost his life. He got like assaulted uh, earlier this year, going back to our whole security issue. Uh, sometimes people that. can misinterpret a story and, and some people are not rational in the head and, they'll overreact and, and do violent things. And he was like surprised attacked by somebody that like, pistol whipped in the head and was uh, pretty badly injured, hospitalized, I believe. And um, thankful that he's all right, made it through. And he's still with us today. Cause I think that he makes some killer shit. He's an awesome dude. He shared a ton of uh, information on feminized breeding and uh, just breeding in general about cannabis and has been a figure in the cannabis space for a long time that I think uh, has been respectable in his practices and sharing his genetics and uh, sharing his information. So Big ups to Mr. Soul, uh, badass dude for sure. And uh, Kyle, I hope that you and him eventually get to do some work together and uh, good things come from it for the community. Because I know a lot of people here in this chat would be very interested in some seeds that come from both you and him or a combination of both uh, because that's what this thing's all about. Um, I think that a lot of people look down on new strains coming out, but I think the cannabis has gotten better and better and it's cool to see. Um, Like one of those cuts you were talking about, runts for example i think it's gone for like five grand in the past few years and people get all up in arms about that but there are companies that see the value in it enough to get that cut pay that money and then they can make their money back on it so it just shows you how valuable and how powerful cannabis is and can be yeah they make it back on like a 100th of their harvest <laughs> you know yeah yeah it's, it's super easy with scale especially to make your money back or even like people that then go and sell the clone like they're like oh i bought it for five thousand i can make that back on you know a hundred dollars a cut or ten dollars a cut and sell a bunch of them it's like however they got to go about doing it but um i think that the community is is really beautiful in that regards a lot of the stuff does get shared and does get out uh, whether people want to call it fake or not Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't, but sometimes it's worth the hunt. And uh, that's the beauty of it all. I'm going to pass it first this time to Noah the Groa. Uh, we've got about eight minutes left. So final thoughts from Noah and uh, any shout outs? Yeah, no, no final thoughts. Just uh, been listening to everyone and uh, yeah, good show. Uh, I'm Noah the Groa on Instagram. If uh, you want to look me up, there you go. And uh, everybody have a good day. Thank you again for joining us, Noah. Always a pleasure. Next up, Aaron, the grower. Yes, except it's the, because Noah's the, and I don't want to get it mixed up. But anyway, this has been a really fucking cool show. Um, Kyle, big flex, bro. Like, you got some fucking gear over there. And uh, yeah, so this was really cool. And it was cool to examine the big plants and stuff. That was a lot of fun. I am Aaron the Grower, ATG Acres on Instagram, YouTube, and .com on the internet. Um, thanks for having me. Thanks for joining us. Always a pleasure. And I hope that you and the family are all doing well. Next up, the American one. Jack, it's good to have you back. Thanks for hosting tonight. And we'll shout out Shane for uh, bringing us all together. Um, Excellent panel tonight. It was nice and laid back, laid back. Um, I'm glad everyone was in chat. And yeah, let's try, let's try and uh, hunt down the biggest picture of the biggest cannabis plant we could find. That'd be pretty cool. I think uh, I can't, I couldn't find any. I was just searching the whole time, but uh, I'm really intrigued. I wonder what the really biggest one was. So. We're challenging you, chat. Find bigger than yeah, that everybody. video that we posted this week. Go look, go yeah. find it. I think they're out there. I've seen yeah, some. You- you win a free pack of seeds. <laughs> Good stuff. Well, uh, next up, we have Kyle Breeder. Yeah, thanks, guys. I'm so glad we still do this, man. You know, uh, sometimes I forget. You know, I mean, we're all wicked busy. And, uh, you know, sometimes I forget what we're doing. But, uh, at the, you know, at the end of the day, it's, uh, I get a lot of positive feedback. And I even get a lot of people recently 
what keeps me in check is I get these emails or these messages from people saying, oh, I'm from the, you know, the cheap home grow show. I'm like, wow, that thing, we must be doing pretty good because I get, you know, all these people. But uh, so I'm just glad we're still doing this, Jack. Thanks for, you know, picking up the, the torch where it left off. I'm glad everyone's still doing this. But um, yeah, if anybody wants to look at anything I'm doing, predicated breeding, not predictive, predicative uh, breeding on all social media platforms. I have a website where you can get seeds, which is pbreeding.com. I have a new drop coming the 23rd of this month. And uh, yeah, I mean, feel free to reach out if you, if you have any questions. I am doing a seed giveaway. So if anyone's involved in that, I'm, I do one every week. Uh, I started on Wednesday. Uh, basically, people are just, I'm just giving out free seeds to people, uh, the community. So if you want to get involved in that, just check on my, my social media. You can get that. And I uh, hope everyone's doing okay. I'll see you guys next week. Thanks, as always, for joining us, Kyle. It's always a pleasure to have you. Uh, last but certainly not least, Matthew Gates. Yeah, thanks a lot. Um, I really like the topics that we were talking about. And uh, I especially always appreciate when we get to talk about cool intricacies like um, like cybersecurity and, and weird stuff like that. But it's all related, right? So if you want to find more stuff related to pest control in particular, you can find them in three places, mainly my Twitter account at Sync Angel, my YouTube account, uh, Zenthanol. And also on Instagram, which is also at Sync Angel. Thank you very much for joining us. As always, uh, thankful to have you and uh, IPM's perspective, as well as uh, this week's security perspective. Uh, it's great to offer multiple perspectives about growing or even grow related things, because I think so often um, people just want to think about the nitty gritty of growing. We could talk about how to, how to plant a seed, how to transplant a clone, how to top, how to do this or that. But I think it is important to evaluate and, and discuss some of the things outside of growing that you have to do in order to grow the security, the setting up the grow space, the buying of the equipment, gathering the equipment, all of those things uh, are part of being a grower that people don't think about or don't write articles about or do podcasts about sometimes. So I'm glad that we were able to touch on some of those things and elaborate on them tonight. I always appreciate my panel. I always appreciate the live chat who's with us. Uh, shout out to some of you, Stony like baloney, uh, lobster, bush bro, shredders, zero nine one one. Uh, and keeper of the strains big ups to everybody else who joined live on youtube 132 of you here right now thank you so much for joining and Woo! i'll get the podcast posted up this evening later this evening so it'll be up i'll write up a little description and uh post it to all the podcast platforms my name is at jack greenstock as you can see right here behind me on cannabis the cannabis friendly social media app that i barely ever use more likely to find me on instagram under the same name also use twitter uh somewhat often more often talking about Twitter, uh, doing like Tesla things over there uh, as often as I'm talking about plant things over there. But uh, you can find me at Jack underscore Greenstock on Twitter. And lastly, uh, 50strains.com. If you'd like a copy of my book, 50 Strains of Green, you can go on 50strains.com and get yourself a copy there if you haven't already. Thank you to everybody who's already gotten a copy. Uh, peace and love. I will see you all next week. Make sure to go check out the Michigan Bros Grow Show. We've got about three minutes until that starts up. So I will uh, go ahead and sign out so you guys can go refill your trays, hit the bathroom, get yourself something to drink, and have a good rest of your evening. Thank you all for coming. Peace and love. Jack Greenstock, signing out. Grow his love. Grow his love. Happy growing. Yeah, grow his love for Dr. MJ, who wasn't with us this week. And again, happy birthday to Spartan Grown, who uh, may or may not be on Michigan Bros Grow Show tonight. But definitely uh, make sure to check them out.